Ash, do you remember our promise? I I think I do, but remind me again? It was to discuss the video game Signalis on the fourth episode of our blockbuster podcast, The List Goes On. Oh shit, we did promise that, didn't we? Yeah, it was a very odd thing to promise, especially so long ago. Oh, but I had so many other ideas, Ash. Look, I have... But, Connor, I felt that it was important. We've done three episodes now, and none of the games we've talked about have actually released past, what is it, 2005? <laughs> That's true, that's true. Yeah. Um, I think, actually, looking at most of our backlog, it's going to be a while before we play a game that isn't from 2005. <laughs> so this will be a welcome Yeah, break. so we decided to intercut our backlog with a game that we recently finished. Mm-hmm. And by recently, I mean about two hours ago. Yeah, um, we... I mean, for, for the first time, like, this is my first time playing this mm, game. Yeah. We, we wrapped it up two hours ago and uh, got quite a bit to say. Yeah. So the game in question is a recently released independent video game named Signalis, which is a kind of survival horror homage, much in the style of old Resident Evil and Silent Hill games. Yep, this this was made by a company called Rose Engine. Which, made of two people. Two people. Which is us. <laughs> like, those two people decided to make an entire ass video game and win a bunch of awards. Yeah. We made this podcast. Uh, you're saying that, like, this podcast isn't going to take away, like, every award at the... Exactly, at, at the potties. At the potties. Yeah. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. That, that, that can't be real, can it? There's no place <laughs> called the potties. I think there might be a podcast award, but I don't know if it's called the potties. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, I mean, nominate us at the next... Yeah, pod- do, do your write-in campaign, elect us to the Senate. Um, <laughs> so, this is going to be a little odd, because as I say, this is a recently released video game. Mm. So there's less individual background with it from the two of us i feel like the first three games we talked about it was like oh when i was young i played shadow the hedgehog or i had a copy of clock tower free loan to me and things like that yeah this game is more i guess it's more indicative of one of the f- the three categories we were talking about yes well we, we, this would definitely be on quality wouldn't it yeah well this is more a game that i finished for myself earlier this year and then said to myself oh i think connor would like this i want to play this with connor Yep, and and then we and then we did. Um, I think the playthrough that you did was about seven hours, but the one it took me ten because I'm a slow bitch. And uh, yeah, you're very uh, plodding. Listen, I liked. I, I, it's like a meal to me. I like to savor a game. Yeah, I exactly. like to take my time. You've got a refined taste. Yeah, and, a palate. I, and I like to wander one corridor back and forth trying to find the right door. Um, <laughs> All right, so Signalis. Yeah, it's a game. Most certainly is. Yeah. Um, Thank you for listening. <laughs> It's difficult. I, I was saying to Connor before we started recording that it's actually a little more... I don't quite know as well how to introduce it because it's so it's so fresh in the mind. You know, It's not something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Mm, yeah. But I guess I'll start with the premise. Yeah, go so, ahead. So, in a far, far future, in an authoritarian government, a robot lady whose name is Elster has woken up on a mysterious ship crash-landed on a frozen planet. Yeah. The only thing she knows is that her commander, or her friend, if, if you want to see it that way, has gone missing, and so she sets out on a journey to find her. This leads her through a kind of metaphysical mindscape, I suppose, mm. in which she is travelling from different location to different location, solving puzzles, fighting enemies, and trying to piece together this very abstract, fragmented story. Yeah, it, it, it abstracts the right way to put it. You get put through several different perspectives, yeah. locations you seem to just jump between. Yeah, it's obvious you're jumping from like planet to planet at certain yeah. points. And at some point, you start to question whether or not, at least I was questioning if it was person to person, mm. because uh, the game goes into several themes about... Uh, Quite a lot of sci-fi does this, where there are themes of the self and about like like who one really is, uh, about um, like the value of of human and artificial life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and this game really leads into that quite a bit with its very premise. As, mm, as yeah, like like it 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 it's dripping with a very very thick atmosphere and psychological horror elements. Yeah, exactly. That play yeah. into this. So I think the most important background element that we need to explain for people to understand the plot of this game Mm. is the relationship between replicas and gestalts. Yes. So a replica is a robot? Question mark? Yeah, it seems to be going down that kind of uh, Blade Runner school. Yeah, or like Alien or something like that. Where it's more a synthetic person rather than a machine. Yeah, because every component that makes up for them is a sort of mimicry of an organic component. Um, like they eat, they bleed, yeah. they sleep. Like they, they require much of the same biological desires. What's that thing you always talk about? Oh, like Pavlov's list of desires or whatever. Oh, oh yeah, the hierarchy of needs. Yeah, they, they have... still have all those elements, um, but they are made 
in a factory. They are produced by yeah. a other by another human, basically. Yeah, I mean, not to jump the gun too much, but you find documents in quite a few pieces of the game where a lot of the ways you find out about replicas is psychological profiles. Yeah, yeah. This is a very interesting angle to go for. It's not just, oh, we made this specific replica to do this specific job. Yeah. No, they talk about how it's not just a case of, oh, we made this replica to do yeah. this specific job. They talk about how the psychological profiles of each of these machines fits a certain job for them better than others. Exactly. Well, because the kind of premise is that they make the body and then they have to imprint a kind of brain signal into them. Mm. It's like a template of a person who they've used for these robots. Mm. So it will be, oh, this unit of robot is designed of a person who was a soldier in their life, so they're more suited for combat situations. Yeah. Or this person was an artist, so they're suited for these things and things yeah. like that. And so the mass-produced element of it is that they have these templates and they'll make dozens and dozens of that template of that person. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, I in the few sort of bits of uh, fiction I've ever dabbled in making myself, I really enjoy the concepts of... Um, I guess I, I look at it more in terms of clones, but this yeah. is an interesting take of it being outright machines, where you take one specific person and you replicate them multiple times to fill out a workforce or, yeah, yeah. or some kind of some kind of uh, career path that requires massive numbers of people. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Signalis does that in a very interesting way, which yeah. you, you mentioned they, they transmit a signal of a person. That's an interesting word to use, given the... Yeah, a Signalis, if you will. Hmm. But like, for instance, you're playing as a robot who, or a re replica, I should say, whose name is False Elster. Yeah, Elster. Uh, Elster. Don't know why I messed that up so bad. But Elster is based off a soldier who fought in a war um, that's important to the to the game setting, mm. and because of that, she's like she's a loner. You're not supposed to talk to her too much or show her anything to do with the war. Mm. And she kind of like she thrives in isolated situations and things like that. So it's kind of like it's like you get this manual for how to work this robot, and the manual says play it music or let it keep collections or a pet because yeah. otherwise it will break. Yes, um, which is again another really interesting angle. Since this is a setting that has space exploration, yeah. um, they, um, um, Gestalts and Replicas are both sent on missions in order to find other planets. Yeah, and just to clarify, Gestalts are their human commanders, basically. Yeah. That they manage Replicas. Yeah, which I, I found that very interesting. They they don't just call them people. They, mm. they, they I mean, Gestalt, um, they, they, there's a lot of Germanic uh, language yeah, in well, this game. Yeah, well, Gestalt and Replica are like two, there's like a philosophical concept that talks about Gestalts and Replicas. Mm. Like, for instance, this is a very uh, low-brow example, but mm. the first Nier game, its two versions are called Nier gestalt and near replicant oh interesting yeah. that is not a source of inspiration i thought this game would take yeah um that's kind of cool yeah, uh, yeah, yeah i mean as far as the uh the the kind of what would you call them these these sources of inspiration that this game takes um it's very much a homage to um some of the bigger survival horrors in the industry yeah i think i always say it's like it's the gameplay of resident evil with the aesthetics and style of silent hill i think i'd agree with that yeah, yeah. um like, like, I mean, Resident Evil 1 is the one that especially comes to mind with this one um, in, in many ways, with the health meter and the limited inventory and everything like that. Yeah, so Connor, kind of tell me, what is the structure of this game? What do you do? So, um, in this game, you spend quite a chunk of it, um, like, traversing these uh, quite tight environments, doing a mixture of exploration, puzzle solving, and... Um, I don't want to say combat, because that implies that you're meant to kill your way through everything. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But... Um, there, there is, you know, there are obstacles that will do direct harm to you yeah. and that you have to uh, confront. Yeah. Um, and... so, so like much like Resident Evil, there is a dense map mm. with a bunch of rooms. You're kind of in, you're always in an interior location, like a man-made structure. Mm. Your progress is gated by a bunch of puzzles that exist around the rooms. Mm. And the fun of it is figuring out different routes through these areas that involve as little combat or as little resource drain as possible. Yeah, because that's what that's what combat really is. It's, mm. a, it's an excuse to sort of manage your resources, yeah, really. Exactly. Um, with such a small inventory, carrying a weapon and the ammunition for it is already two-thirds of... No, yeah. Not two-thirds, one-third of your inventory yeah. gone. 
Um, I always like to think of it, like I always describe it as being almost roguelike in mm. a weird way. It's like very run based because yeah. you have your home base, which is always your safe room. It's the safe room in this game, the same way that it would be in a Resident Evil game Yeah, where you have your item box and you have a map and you look at it and you go, all right, I want to go there, there and there to solve this puzzle, this puzzle and this puzzle. Mm. I know there are these enemies there. I know I can pick up these items. I know I need to have these things in my inventory. Mm. And then you execute on that run, go back to your safe room and think, all right, what's the next part of that plan? What have I opened up by doing that? Mm. How many res- How much ammo or health items did I use? And how is that going to make me recalibrate my way through this area? Mm. Yeah, it, it, I mean, the limited inventory really enables that. It's yeah. do- definitely doing that speed run thing, which is quite refreshing because I think in terms of the general aesthetics and presentation of this game, it comes across far more as a direct homage to something like Silent Hill, especially Silent Hill 2. Mm. Um, well, because so- that's, that's that's the gameplay stuff it takes from Silent Hill as opposed to Resident Evil, because Resident mm. Evil is always, you are in the mansion, mm. you are in the police station, and further levels are more just exploring different areas around that place mm. there is certain points in which you go to new areas like the labs in, in resident evil 2 and stuff like that but silent hill is more level based it's more here you are in the apartments and then you move to the hospital and then you move to that yes and this game's more like that where it's levels rather than one big location yeah each of the chapters might be broken up by uh, something that kind of is is of, is of note and interesting um like you might find yourself in a change of perspective mm. you end up in a first person section doing yeah. something very different from the rest of the game yeah there's a lots of like really good transition between different levels and things like that yeah but um but they are very marked very clearly divided into sections that they are that they are and there's no going back there's which, no going back no yeah which is kind of neat all things considered yeah um, yeah in terms of the gameplay as well, like we briefly mentioned about the kind of puzzle solving and combat and the like. Yeah. Um, specifically, the way the combat works is that when you're equipped with a weapon, it's almost always a firearm. Um, you can kind of hold down uh, your aim in order to kind of tighten up your crosshair. Yeah. So the game is isometric, I guess. Yeah. Not isometric, but it's like it's like... It's like the camera is above the map and yeah. it's looking down. Isometric is a very confusing term mm. because I was always of the opinion isometric meant you were at a weird kind of 45 degree angle in the sky. I'm yeah. thinking things like the original Fallout games. Yeah. Apparently, though, isometric can mean the exact same angle that Signalis is in. Because one time uh, a friend of mine and I got into a debate about this where he was describing Link to the Past, uh, which was a Zelda game, saying that's an isometric game. Yeah. And I was like, no, it isn't. Like, it doesn't look anything like that. But it is isometric yeah. um, so like the, the important thing is that there is no camera control no like the camera is fixed above the arena that you're in and mm. you're moving a character along in, in, in third person yeah it's not doing the resident evil one thing where it snaps between different corners no yeah the... each room has its angle and that's it yeah so things are like fairly clearly displayed and everything but um you have to you, the positioning of your character affects your aim and like and, and and how long you're able to kind of hold down your aim for affects how accurate your shot might be. Yeah, it's kind of almost like a dual stick shooter in which you hold, you're moving around with L and then you go into a combat stance by holding down ZL or R2 or whatever controller is in your controller mm. and she'll aim and then you can move the right stick and she'll spin. Mm. Like, depending on what position you're pointing the stick in, she'll follow like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's got a little bit of that uh, survival horror clunk, which is... Um, not always the most satisfying thing to to play, but it is kind of necessary for a certain sense of tension. Because yeah. Because having uh, having completely fluent control in a horror setting isn't. You have to be very careful with that because you end up making your obstacle course of threats and foes and everything uh, a lot easier to traverse and mm, get around in yeah. those circumstances. Although I will say there are two elements about it that I think make it a little worse than those similar ideas that are in Silent Hill 2 and, and the Resident Evil games. Okay. One of them is the quantity of enemies that can be in a given room. Mm. There are some areas in this game in which there are like six to seven monsters at any given time. Mm. And all of those rooms, they're more a pain to deal with. Mm. Like Resident Evil, like the most, there will be, there'll be like free zombies and they move very slowly. So it's easy to deal with them. The other problem is that those games have really, really fierce auto aim. Mm. And Signalis has it, but it's more a hindrance than it is a help, Mm. especially when combined with those enemy quantities, because you're trying to shoot at specific characters, and Elster will just aim at someone else. Yeah. And it's really hard to know how to make it unlock from that person. Oh, good. That was was screwing me up a lot in our playthrough, where um, uh, it, it it was always that. It was... 
trying to aim for a particular enemy in a snap to see if I can deal with them and finding that I, I, Elster just would not lock onto the right enemy. Like, she'd, yeah. she'd go after someone that was two meters away rather than the one that was right in her face. Yeah, yeah. Um, and The game also has this, like, automatic shove when enemies are close to you. Yeah, which is kind of a quality of life, I would yeah. say. It's nice to have. But it's also like, just shoot a man, just kill him with a gun, and then we'll be fine. Yeah. Like, you get into this weird situation in which one enemy is coming towards you, and you shove them away, and then they walk back up to you, and you shove them away. And it looks yeah. a little silly, because they're also just swinging their arms wildly. A little bit. There's yeah. there's lots of ideas that I really like and think work, and others that I, I sort of struggle with, despite them being good in sort of concepts. Yeah. Um, I, I I really like the way that the aim mechanic works, you know, when it does work yeah. and when I and when my character isn't just like spinning around trying to lock onto <laughs> yeah. someone. Because um, I, I really like how if you aim at a target for a period of time the like aiming reticule will shrink and you'll do more damage to them. Yeah, that's that's the that's the kind of accuracy yeah. angle that I quite like. It's also willing to tell you when an enemy is actually kind of blocking your attack and when your aim isn't going to help at all. Yeah, because there's like a square, isn't there? And if mm. there's an X through the square, the shot will be blocked by a shield or by debris or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really nice thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very much a good thing over something like the original Resident Evil 1 where, well, all, the, all three of the original Resident Evils, where your character just kind of automatically attacks mm. and... It's kind of random when the enemy goes down. Like, how many bullets was enough to kill the zombie? Yeah, they all have randomized health pools. Yeah. Whereas here, it's a little bit more consistent, and you having the aim gives you a bit more direct control in that. Front. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, like those games, combat is more an excuse for you to have to waste ammo and for you to lose resources, basically. Yeah, when really you want to be saving, especially for your heavier weapons, you want to save that ammo for the fights that you uh, cannot dodge, you know, particularly boss fights and confrontations like yeah, that. Yeah, like story encounters and things like that. Exactly, yeah. Um, but beyond that, there's also the kind of plethora of puzzles. They very much borrow from other survival horrors as well, The um, a few ideas. Some of them are the most basic, bring A to B, whereas yeah. others of them, uh, you might have to be studying a note and see what that says in order to uh, put a certain number of items in a certain combination. Yeah, so I think there's three puzzles at the end of the day. One of them is bring A to B. So mm -hmm. it's, you need a key for this door, mm -hmm. or you need a thing to unlock this area, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. The other one is flick some switches until it says you're good. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh, there's a furnace, just twiddle like twiddle the nozzle until you get win, basically. Mm -hmm. And then there's riddles, where it's like, you have, like, six items, let's say, and you have to take it to a certain area and arrange them according to a cryptic note that's left to the side of it. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah. I guess I'd argue that it's potentially a fourth. There's a few specific unique puzzles where you have to kind of... You might be, say, um, you might have to install some kind of computer thing onto another thing, and you're trying to kind of line up certain lines together yeah, yeah. Or, or, or getting frequencies right, which I realise I'm saying that. I'm not even talking about the radio that's in that game, <laughs> which that's another puzzle-solving and enemy encounter thing as well, which I really, really like. Yeah. Um, being a artificial thing I, I i want to call her her robot i know she's not a replica a replica um yeah. she, you have a radio that's installed in your person that can uh, they call it like a module yeah, yeah and you switch it to certain frequencies um using the if you're if you're playing on a console you'd be using the d-pad to do that uh in some in some cases there are particular enemies where you need to fiddle with the radio to remove them from the encounter. Yeah, those are some of my favorite enemies in the game because the all of the enemies are replicas. Mm. Um so in Elster's travels, she has she ends up in this mining facility on a place called Sapinski. Yes. Um and the facility has been recently afflicted by some kind of strange disease that has killed all the gestalts. Mm. And by kill, I mean like they fade into like stains on a wall like it's mm. it's kind of fucked up like yeah. you're going through a lot of areas and they'll just be like the shadow of someone where a gestalt used to be mm. um but it has made all of the replicas into mindless hostile puppets basically who just attack anyone who enters into their domain yeah um so all the enemies are some variant of a replica and so there'll be information on what they were before they were a horrible zombie mm. so for instance the radio heads as i guess i can call them yeah i suppose <laughs> um are based off a robot type that's called a calibri 
Mm. And the things about Calibris is that they actually all exist in this weird hive mind. Mm. Like they can all basically communicate with one another and they're used to calm the emotions of people around them by kind of like soothing their minds, basically. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of talk amongst them about harmony. Yeah. Um, one character in particular that you might encounter was someone who is one of these robots that has not been afflicted by the disease or yeah. been turned into this horrible thing. She talks about how um, she has been isolated from the songs of the others and yeah. how that makes her feel alone. Despite the fact that as far as we're aware, she's the only working version of these things that are left. Yeah. She's the one that's supposed to be... That she's the one that's doing her job correctly and she feels alone and ostracized. Compared well, I think to the, the implication is that she can still hear the the minds of all the corrupted ones. Ah. And she's like, they're all singing this horrible song. I don't know why they're doing it. It's freaking me out. Because mm. I'm still trying to sing my normal one and they're all just saying Rachel slurs or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they might as well be. Because um, they, they distort the screen as well, which is a really cool visual element. Yeah, is, yeah. is the... And you can take out the enemy by shooting them, but you still need to do something with the radio transmission. So, to... like, there'll be, like, five of them. Mm. And once you tune your radio to the right transmission, it will, like, have a red circle upon the one who's the real one. And if you mm. shoot them, that will kill them. Yeah. But you can't, with the way that the combat system works, you you can't just, like, trial and error it. And there's no AoE attack that just deals with them all yeah. in a clump. And obviously you don't want to be wasting your valuable resources shooting, like illusions basically yeah exactly so they give you the option to deal with that without expending a single bullet and yeah. those are always fun for me it's just it's basically twiddling the knobs of a radio to yeah yeah because then there are a bunch of puzzles where it's a there's a lot of boxes with speakers into them and you have to find the right radio frequency mm. or there'll be a radio station that's that's uh giving out the code to a wall safe or something like that yeah i really like these as puzzle elements too they like tie the radio into this really like, kind of like cool yeah um, exactly like tool that you and they have. do a lot of really good visuals with it because like a lot of the distortions in the game are like a signal being corrupted like it's mm. like a bunch of macro blocking will appear in the screen and things like that and random words will start to appear and it's it's really Really interesting as a, as a unique gameplay element. Yeah, I think one thing that sticks with me is a particular instance where I don't, I won't go into the context of it just for the sake of spoilers, but it may, it effectively plays a song through the radio. Yeah, and there was a while we we did that, and I didn't want to turn the radio off. Yeah. I just liked that song playing as we yeah, were. Yeah, no, we were it was it was really evocative. It was it was really cool, mm. and it's cool how much the radio just uses is, is used across different elements of the game, like the story, the enemies, the puzzles. It's it's really well. Yes, I think that's the right way to put it. Yeah. I guess we could also talk about the sort of other tools we have at our disposal um, in order to deal with enemies, which are, of course, the plethora of weapons. Mm. They are a very standard affair for a survival horror. Very classic, yeah. yeah. If you have played... I, I, I would argue this is closer to Silent Hill than Resident Evil. It is, in, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, what seals the deal is the rifle being the most powerful weapon exactly yeah you have a you have a basic handgun curiously in a 10 millimeter round i think most uh most people would be used to a pistol being a 9 millimeter or 45 acp but they go a little bit more sci-fi with it yeah yeah um even if that might be something people are developing but i don't know much about guns um <laughs> Then you have a shotgun, which is better for crowd control. That that's it's the kind of weapon that carries you through your first or second boss. That's true. Although um, I will say, the shotgun, I don't like it in this game so much. It wasn't. It doesn't give me that same kind of satisfying crunch. There's that, not much oomph to it. Yeah, and it can also be difficult to tell with the perspective how effective the spread is. Because mm. I feel like we kept having situations in which there were rooms with multiple enemies mm. and it was like, oh, the shotgun's going to be perfect for this. Yeah. And you would wait for all three enemies to crowd around you, shoot the shotgun, and it would only hit one of them. Mm. And they'd be like, but they're all right in front of me. What's yeah. the spread on this gun? Yeah, they weren't so close either that it wasn't like all the pellets were being caught by one person. Exactly. Like, surely, yeah. Yeah, like it but... felt from the visuals that we were going to hit all three of them and then we mm. didn't and lost resources. Yeah, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. And I'd argue the same as well about the revolver weapon. Mm. Um, I kind of... My fondest memory of using the revolver was just getting goofy while we were playing it <laughs> and just being like, Ash, I'm going to go be a cowboy. Yes, and that was one of your many repeated <laughs> points I, when we I, had that. I do. You, you have to understand, if you ever thought, oh, what if the what if the two of us record our play sessions trust us no no you one no one can know you, you don't i am insufferable it's uh, a combination of incredibly old in jokes mm. and just saying the same thing over and over yeah it's it's uh it's enough to drive ash up the wall um, <laughs> to drive is, me to madness yeah, yeah no absolutely which has been my goal the whole time yeah um so but... then you also have a so this is actually a good segue into an element of the gameplay that we haven't talked about yet mm. which is the flare gun oh yes because in another 
I'm going to air quotes homage to Resident Evil. <laughs> um, enemies will not stay dead forever. Mm. Once you shoot them, they'll be on the ground. And it's actually really cool because like little localized radio distortions will appear around their corpses. Mm. Like I'm not sure if you noticed, but that's the visual tell for when they're going to come back to life. Mm. Like there's little distortions around them. Um, the only way that you can stop this is by burning them. Mm. But obviously the resources that you need to burn them are incredibly limited. Like I think you get like maybe five or seven flares over the whole game. I think it wasn't much. I Sorry, not not it's like thermite flares. Not the not the ammo for the flare gun, but yeah. like actual flares. Yeah, there's I think there's less there's definitely less than ten of them. Yeah. yeah. Um and, and And there's way more than ten enemies, I can tell you that. Oh for sure. ab- absolutely. So you have to be fairly tactical with it yeah. um my preference my preference was always to burn the enemies that were at the entrance to a safe room yeah it would always be burn co- enemies in corridors that lead to multiple areas because you're going to have to go through those areas a lot mm. yeah yeah absolutely but then of course you find a flare gun which is a lot of fun because you just shoot a flare at someone, kills them instantly, and burns their corpse as they drop to the ground. Only case I would say it wasn't a good idea is areas with multiple enemies. Yeah, because it's very slow. <laughs> yeah, very slow. You've got to reload it, and you're probably going to get swarmed by that point. So it, it, it's 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 still a weapon with a trade-off. It's yeah, not, yeah. like, overpowered. Um, the thing that's weird about it, though, is that, like we were saying, the combat in the game feels more like an excuse to waste resources. Mm. So it kind of feels odd that there's so many guns because it's just... I don't care about the shooting in this game. Yeah, I I think I would like... I wouldn't mind a game that has these kind of shooting mechanics if it was a little bit more fluid and more focused on the matter. Mm. Um, like, it it serves, I think, the, the purpose of this game quite well. Um, but you have so many weapons that I want to use. We I didn't get to use the final weapon, which was the rifle. It's not really the final, but, like, the biggest weapon, yeah, which is the yeah. rifle. Um, until basically the last boss, because <laughs> well, you had me sitting behind your ear, going like, "Don't use your resources, Connor." Yeah, don't, don't I know do you it. have hundreds of pieces of ammo, but what if you need it for the final boss? And sure enough, I did. Yeah, I, I go, burned yeah. through all those rifle rounds on the final boss, but, and and very very satisfying weapon. It's mm. it's effectively a one shot kill on a lot of enemies. Yeah, it's, um, it feels but... good to shoot as well. Like you just like, Poof! yeah. It's actually so funny because you get the rifle from a character by doing a side quest. Yeah. And she actually fires it at a boss, ending the boss fight. Mm. But when she shoots it, it, the power of it is so fierce that it knocks her over. <laughs> yeah, it does. She has to, She's like on a, on a little hospital bed yeah, for the yeah, rest of yeah. the game. Yeah, it's... <laughs> like, you really feel how impactful that gun is when you shoot it. Yeah, really good way of setting up a weapon like that. A lot better than, say, like the Silent Hill 2 rifle, which is just... That's the most powerful gun in that game, I think. Yeah, it and, is, yeah. And yet, I never felt it was very satisfying. In a way, I would. Uh, in a way, I think my perfect survival horror weapon lineup would be Silent Hill 2 shotgun, but this game's rifle. Yeah, and maybe yeah. swapping them over at, <laughs> at any given point. Exactly. Um, yeah. um, other than that, to my surprise, though, uh, I didn't expect there to be a submachine gun in this game, and that thing is fucking fun. Uh, that Every thing... survival horror game seems to be ashamed of the fact that it has a submachine gun in it. <laughs> it does. Like they always hide them, or they're right at the very end. Yeah. Like it's always like I was playing um the Evil Within two the other day, mm. and you literally get a, a submachine gun in the last hour of the game. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, su- Silent Hill three, the submachine you get so little ammo for that submachine yeah, gun. Yeah, yeah, it's really not um, very viable. Um, like the uh, the submachine gun in the RE two remake. Yeah, it's like a it's like an equivalent like power weapon. It's not mm. like to be used on conventional enemies. It kind of nullifies that problem of there being a lot of enemies because you just go into a room and you're just like, rattle them, boys! <laughs> <laughs> Should have been just straight up a Chicago type. Yeah, that yeah. would have been great. Um, Get Elster a little hat. Oh, that'd be that'd be great. That that'd be a really fun, uh, completely against the tone and, and yeah. of the game. But I would love that as a, as a new game plus thing. Actually, um, you saying that makes me realize the one thing that this game doesn't take from its from its predecessors, which is unlockable stuff. No, there's... like you don't get no costumes. There's no secret weapons. It's no. just you beat it and you beat it. Uh, I would love for Elster to be like Chainsaw James, yeah. where you just you just do a one hit kill chainsaw, <laughs> like on different everything. costumes for Elster, you know? Yeah, Cow- Cowboy Cowboy Elster would have been great. I would have had a whale of a time with the fucking yeah. revolver. Maybe asking a little too much of a two person team, but uh, you know. Ah, uh, I, I I don't know how successful this game's been, but I wouldn't mind an update. I mean, the game does have a physical release now. It does. You've you've got a physical copy. I do. Signalis. I have a physical Switch copy of the game, which is the version of the game that we were playing. Mm. Um, I would recommend it to all. It's very nice. It's got a lot of nice art on it. Yeah. But I think it was successful. It won a lot of awards. I think for me, it's definitely the indie darling of last year. Yeah. Would you say it's your favorite game of last year? It is. It beats out such contenders as Strangers of Paradise, Final Fantasy Origin, <laughs> and Atlas's premier Soul Hackers 2. 
Uh, well, I mean, I can't. I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm going to be married to Total War Warhammer, so you know. Uh, t- <laughs> hey, everyone! Connor mentioned Warhammer. <laughs> oh gosh, no! Nah, Take it off your bingo cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I, what would a bingo card for this podcast even be like? I think I, I definitely love- would have a game of two halves on it. Yeah, if if we're, when we get like ten episodes in, I wouldn't mind seeing what a bingo yeah. card. Yeah, one of you get to work on that. We'd appreciate that greatly. Thank you very much. We won't pay you. I'll I'll, I'll feature it on like social media <laughs> and stuff though, because I think that'd be very. very you could fun. win a fabulous prize, <laughs> exposure. Oh gosh. And a washer dryer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a picture of a washer dryer. How I'll, about I'll that? send you a picture of Connor's feet. <laughs> no, no, no! Do not, do not. That's a promise this. now. Oh, subscribe to the Christ. Patreon and you'll get that. No. <laughs> yeah, subscribe. Oh, fuck. You, get... you can cut this out if you want. No, I'm going to keep this thing because it's <laughs> hilarious, but like, it's a slippery slope to getting an OnlyFans. All right, um, so those are those kind of the main weapons? I guess other than some of the disposable items. Um... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the game has a lot of sub-weapons, which are items you can equip and then use by pressing the left bumper. Mm-hmm. Um, those include a auto injector, which actually, if you die, you inject yourself with one of those, putting it back up to full health, which mm-hmm. is really convenient. Yeah. You have like a stun prod. Um, annoyingly, the flashlight is one of those items. Like you have to equip it to a slot. Yeah. 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 As well as the photo module. Oh. <laughs> which lets you take pictures in the game. Yes. Which seems like a, you know, really good idea for when you're doing puzzles. You yeah. know, you want to get a picture of an area for a puzzle so that when you go back to another area you've got that information you can readily take out one problem every single platform this game is on has a capture button <laughs> it does uh whether you buy it on steam a switch a playstation or an xbox yeah those all have dedicated take picture buttons yeah would have been a really really cool feature in 2012 yeah yeah not so much now not so much now which is a shame because but... you're never gonna waste an inventory slot with your little photo module gosh no which i mean that would be my gripe is uh, about the limited inventory in this yeah, game. Yeah, so you have six slots, mm. which is not enough. Yeah, that's that's a that's one Chris Redfield worth yeah, of slots, yeah. and that is not you, enough. You have to you have to you have to dedicate a slot to your gun, obviously. Yeah, you have to use you have to get ammo for your gun. Mm. You want to be carrying healing items just in case you take a lot of damage. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, I want to bring one of my sub weapons, like the stun prods. Mm. That's four slots of your six slots. Yeah, so if you find more items in the world, you go, oh sweet, I found some shotgun shells for a later boss fight oh cool i found one of the items i'll need to progress i can't carry anything else it's kind of counter to like the whole pacing of that kind of gameplay structure which i find really fascinating because Mm. it makes you have to constantly run back to the room and Mm. it ruins your run yeah you're like oh i have to go through that corridor again yeah and that corridor again i think the only way i could see it meshing well is if you're looking at the because because you i think you're interested in this from in in like a speed running method yeah yeah It encourages you to memorize where everything is. Yeah. Which is, uh, for someone who doesn't like doing that, a nightmare. Though, no harm on you, yeah. like, like for the record. I think uh, my solution would have been either seven slots, or mm. I would have made, like the Resident Evil remake, sub-weapons would have been not an item you have to carry in your inventory. Mm. Like, you have, an, you have a sub-weapon slot, and you equip something to it, and then it doesn't take up a space in your slot. I agree with that. Because because, because of that, I don't think you ever use the stun batons. I didn't know. I think I only ever used them when my inventory was full and I needed an excuse to yeah to like, get rid of it, get yeah, rid of it, yeah. which was fun. Uh, I I like disposable items. I think that the way that the Resident Evil Two remake and Resident Evil Four remakes handle them are really really cool. Yeah, I haven't played Resident Evil Three remake yet, but whatever. But uh, and, and it's I think... not on the list for those who are wondering. No, no. But I think this game takes some inspiration from um, the, the, those newer iterations of Resident Evil to do those kind of items. Cause yeah. Like, I think the auto injector is a really good idea. Yeah, Espe- it is, yeah. Especially for people who kind of might struggle with these, these kinds of games. Um, or me, who's a dingus. Uh, yeah, but, but it's like, I, I just get annoyed because the inventory restrictions limit the potential to actually use them. Mm. Like, they make you not want to experiment with the weapons because you're like, oh, no, I, I don't have enough slots to try this out, mm. you know? There's also at more than one puzzle where you need to take six items to one place. So mm. if you've been taking them all, putting them in your item box and continuing onward, it then means you've got to completely empty your inventory to put all these items in, then go over to the area with yeah. the puzzle. Kind of gets weird with the pacing because you constantly have to keep going backwards and forwards and backtracking and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
That being said, I do like the flavor of the items. Like you get tarot cards. There's a there's a Russian doll one that I find really cute because yeah, it yeah. it looks like the Russian doll looks like one of the mining robots, and it's really fun. It, to me. It looks like a Star Wars droid. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like this like little round black and red little thing, and it looks mm. it looks like an evil Sith droid to me. <laughs> yeah. And then you can mine three other little dolls into it. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's. It's annoying, the infantry restrictions, but yeah. you can get around it, but it's kind of a pain. No, absolutely. Um, it might be worth mentioning when we talk about the auto-injector, uh, talking a little bit about the healing system, because it's odd. Yeah, it's like, it's very, it's almost completely standard, mm. with like one minor nuance, which is that most healing items don't immediately heal you. No, they recover your health over time, which yeah. I sort of, again, I like the idea of that, but... I didn't find many situations where I felt I'd rather have health recover over time yeah. than just get the healing instantly. When... I think it led to a situation similar to the weapons and the sub weapons where we would there's like an item you can make called the repair spray plus which mm. heals you for a less amount of health but it does it instantly. Mm. And we would just always use those. Yeah, because why if I, if I'm going to if I'm in the middle of a fight and I need to pause my menu to heal, I I want that health now. Yeah, instantaneous. I, I'm, like... I'm not going to take that chance that I might get grabbed and bit and killed by something. Yeah, and, and, and exactly. Yeah. In the middle of healing. So like, I, I, I bet on like higher difficulties, if you're doing like challenge runs, it's really interesting because it's like, okay, I can I can kill all these enemies. I'll take these hits, but then I'll use my repair spray while I'm walking around and mm. that will be more efficient, you know? Yeah. But for our purposes, it's just easier to use the, the instant ones. Yeah. It also makes me think, to reference the Resident Evil 2 remake again, it makes me think about how the blue herbs give you a kind of defense buff for mm, a short yeah, amount of yeah. time. Uh, but it's that, but just with your entire healing. And again, I like the idea you've got an item that can regenerate your health if you're in a really tight situation, but I want some of that instantly, right? Yeah, like yeah. I want to, I, I don't want to... <laughs> I'm now picturing getting like a Mario invincibility star in this game <laughs> and how ridiculous that would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know why my mind, mind jumped to that, but... Just Elster running into these zombies and they're just flying off the screen. <laughs> I mean, in, uh, I think it's Mario World where if you jump while you've got a star, you do somersault. So I'm now just <laughs> picturing Elster somersaulting through a bunch of psychological horrors. I mean, she does do some platforming. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll get to that. That's, that's for later. Um, well, we talked about the arsenal of weapons and tools you have and, and, and alluded to the threats that you use them on. But yeah. do we want to talk a bit more about the enemies? I do. And I very specifically want to talk about the enemies because I actually think they're kind of one of the game's weak points. Uh huh. They're just really... I, I get this from a lot of independent horror games, especially ones that are in 2D. Mm. But they just become weird, squawking little meep things that just walk towards you and make weird noises. And they never really actually threaten me or get under my skin. No, they don't. Well, especially, I mean, we're particularly well adjusted now to this sort of area of survival horror. Yeah, yeah. So it it could be that, but um, yeah, when we know how to kind of avoid enemies and, and, and have figured out the kind of puzzle of this game is to just don't engage in combat all the time yeah, and to be yeah. a bit more elusive, uh, it does mean that enemies need to do a heck of a lot more to be properly scary. Uh, I think this is why things like um, the Resident Evil and Silent Hill games uh, have occasionally they have stalker type enemies. Yeah, yeah. Um, eventually, there's a point in Silent Hill 2 where Pyramid Head is just outright walking around, uh, and you get things like Mr. X, Nemesis, and the like as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the um, this game doesn't really have that. Maybe I don't know if I'd say it's for the best, but like it's probably good to avoid that cliche to stand on its own legs. But yeah, it, it does come up to a point where the enemies just become ineffectual, though. They they do, and my bigger gripe with the enemies isn't so much their effectiveness, although it is very funny. But there's a thing we kept doing where I'd go into a room and enemies would just be standing there and they haven't spot me, and I'd just be shuffling around them, being like, "Oh, they don't even know. Oh, they have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know." I'm here. <laughs> it's definitely I mean part of it is the way that we play these games because mm. it isn't conducive for tension or atmosphere oh yeah but like I, I even got that way when I was doing my solo runs mm. where I, I would just see an enemy like because you're going you're obviously backtracking a lot and you're in these areas for a decent amount of time mm. so you'd always be sneaking past um, enemies consistently and you do the same ones yeah I always think about there's like this shower room it's like this big box of a room with like these shower posts in the middle and there's like four enemies in there mm. and they're on a pretty rigid uh, patrol and you can sneak past them pretty easily like it takes mm. time but you can do it and every time I would just be like oh it's these fucking idiots again <laughs> like they, they hadn't become threats to me anymore no no they hadn't although that being said I think that room in particular there's some higher 
level and the higher level. What this isn't an RPG. <laughs> there are some. Um, yeah, some tough... of them are coloured blue. That's the higher rank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are some tougher enemies that I did have a genuine kind of fear of, mainly because they had ranged attacks. Yeah. And I was like, I do not want to aggro these things because they can just shoot me. Well, <laughs> yeah. um, there's the ones that have shields and things like that. Yeah, as well. Which, if if I'm worried about them being a a obstacle, there is a bit of tension of they are coming towards me and I don't think I'm going to get a clean hit on them. And then that's when things get a bit scary. Yeah. Or when they start like using a boss from earlier in the game as a normal enemy, mm. and you have to start sneaking around them as well. Oh well, I'll I'll throw I'll throw a bone to this over over like Silent Hill Two. I Silent Hill Two has that as well. There's a there's an enemy that's effectively a boss that. Oh, the doorman. Yeah, like I I like is that what they call like they're the called doorman. Yeah, doorman. I thought, yeah. I always thought they were called like bedfellows or something. Bedfellows. Because but... <laughs> because it, it looks like, to me it looks like a guy in a bed. Yeah, um, I think that's what it's supposed to be. But we all just call them doorman. And, and they eventually become a common enemy and they lose their luster a bit. Yeah, I think that this game has a similar thing, uh, with a, with, a, with a particular enemy, and I think it does it better here. Yeah. Uh, one because I think that fight's more fun as a fight here yeah. and also and that enemy is much more intimidating as well it's way more intimidating it, it's it's fucking huge it's, it's got like this... this replica that was made for heavy mining yeah and they're wearing this huge suit yeah and she's got some kind of uh great big uh like... It's like a rail gun or something yeah it's like it's like a mining laser that just shoots a huge huge yeah, beam of yeah. something at you and it, and it does a lot of damage and like a whole gimmick is that she doesn't take any damage, but if you shoot her enough, eventually she'll fall to the ground and like the helmet, like the, the panel, the visor of her helmet will open and just this horrible corrupted blood will pour out. Mm. And you've got to shoot her in there. And it's just horrible. It's yeah. just like, oh God. Yeah. That enemy fucking rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the good miners, I think. Yeah. What I will say is that I think there's, there's at least one enemy in this game where I looked at it and I went, this is just a Silent Hill monster. Yeah, like it like, gets a bit a yeah. bit silly at points. Like, I, I'm not even... I guess that there's, one with, there's one with a kind of a long face that makes me think of the leg people, but that's not the one I find most egregious. There's these ones that crawl out of the floor. They look exactly like the first enemy you encounter in Silent Hill 3. Oh, like the, with, the, with the twisty faces. Yeah, the twisty faces. They've got these round kind of pummely like, arms. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're not as big as they are in Silent Hill 3, but they, they look almost exactly like them. And that took me out of it a little bit. I mean, that's why I keep saying homage and air quoting in our recording studio. Yes, because it, it's... Um... And there's even puzzles that are just literally, like, not taken, but, like, the premise is taken. Mm. Like, there's one area in which there are two hands coming out of a wall and you have to put rings on them in certain mm. order. And that's just a puzzle from Silent Hill 2. <laughs> yeah. I do, I do like how they did it in this yeah, game. Because yeah. there is a... there is That does tie into a theme here. Exactly, um, yeah. But... Um, and it is another thing where these are clearly made in a kind of loving homage, so I wouldn't rail on them too much because yeah. they. I think um, I prepared some very dense notes about this game because mm. I I don't know I was bored at work, <laughs> um, and I do have a big long paragraph about justifying this game's uh, rip offs of Silent Hill. Yeah, but we'll get to that at the end when I read my prepared statement. No, absolutely. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, they. Some of them do a pretty good job of being in the line mm. of the uh, of the inspiration, and others of them kind of take the piss a bit. Yeah, but, a bit too far. Yeah, um, but like like the Calibris, like the radio heads, those mm. are really unique, and those aren't in any other game like yeah. that. You know, I I really like those. Yeah, those yeah. are those are my favorite. And we spoke briefly about them in the weapon section. So I don't know why. Like maybe. I'm now picturing someone who's watching this, listening to this podcast and has gone, I just want to jump into the enemy bit <laughs> and hasn't heard us talk about the Calibris and the weapons bit, but go back to the weapons bit if you, if, if you, if you want to listen to that. But, um, yeah, just put in one, um, uh, timestamp and it's just Calibris. <laughs> Calibri timestamp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the one Calibri guy is going to go, oh, thank God. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to timestamp every time we mention the word Calibri. It's going to be a nightmare. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> but... why these come out so infrequently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess beyond that, the other thing that I would say is that I really enjoy uh, the drip-fed kind of world-building in this game. That you oh yeah, those. because like I was saying earlier, the context of the world and what's going on in the wider universe doesn't actually matter to Elster and her quest to find Ariane, mm. but it's so interesting to read about. Like, it's yeah. a really dense, strange world mm. where it's got all these problems to do with, like, 
replication of people and there's this massive war being fought and it's very authoritarian yeah so the entire game is very like soviet brutalism it is i i mean my assumption is this is meant to be an alternate history where the iron curtain doesn't fall and perhaps goes in favor of the soviets because yeah i mean there's like um there's like symbols of east germany all around yeah it it looks a lot like east germany yeah Mm, it it does And, and that's and that's a really interesting take which it's worth stressing as well the uh, makers of this game. I believe they are German. Yeah, in the credits it says proudly made in Hamburg or something like that. Yeah, yeah. so so that's a very clear local influence. And that's really nice to get out of a game yeah, where yeah. I think a lot of games are either Japanese, American, and a few of them are British. But Well, the game does have a lot of German text as well. It does. Which it uses to great effect. Uh I mean, this game makes me think of the word Aktun. Aktun, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A lot whenever I see that now. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, this is a... I guess it's worth kind of maybe leaning into the sort of the way this game looks and, and all yes. as well. Cause... So obviously as a horror game, mm. atmosphere is very crucial to the success of this game. And oh boy, does Signalis deliver in spades. Yep. Like this game looks incredible. Mm. I uh, as, as fans of the of the kind of uh, PlayStation 1 kind of look mm. and the kind of the lower fidelity and sort of, um, what would you call it? Kind of jaggedy look of all yeah. the survival horror? I think Dr. White, told me to say that this game is very retro futuristic retro future yeah. yeah and um you know and and that really like we're big fans of the way that that looks and we think this game looks brilliant yeah, yeah. i mean when we were young the ps1 was a very big thing so we obviously have a lot of nostalgia for that kind of aesthetic exactly exactly and i i still stand that although i completely get the arguments to say that like 8-bit and 16-bit pixel art can be carried quite a bit further than um, early 3D. Yeah. Um, there's still an appeal to early 3D that I think you can utilize it really well. Like, I'll argue till the cows go home that things like the original Spyro games look beautiful. Mm. Uh, and I think on the opposite end of things, things like um, Silent Hill 1, uh, Nightmare Creatures, those kind of games. <laughs> Nightmare like, Creatures. Right. Yeah, it's, it, does a, <laughs> it does a really good kind of gothic horror. Kind Just of. Just never heard you say Nightmare Creatures before. Uh, they, I mean... It's like the two streams are being crossed. <laughs> there's, there's always a first time for everything. <laughs> Although uh, it is interesting that you talk about um, pixel art holding up better. Mm. Because the game's visuals are kind of pixely. They do a bit of that, yeah. Like, it reminds me of Out of This World or Heart of Darkness, where it's like mm. it's like pixels, but they're very, very detailed, very high fidelity renders, yeah. basically. Is there a game called Heart of Darkness? Yeah, it's, it's, it's by the guy who did Out of This World. And it, it, does it have anything to do with the book? No, it's about space. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. It's very different. Mm. Um, but then when you're looking at puzzle elements or interacting with things in the world, it will then cut to a first person PlayStation 1 looking render where everything's really chunky and all the mm. textures are warping and things like that. Yeah. And, and it looks really good. Mm. The, the uh, I mean, as, as far as visual effects are concerned, we briefly mentioned this about the Calibris. Um, they do distort the screen. And when you get into lower damage, your screen distorts as well. It makes some of the harder boss fights in the game even harder because mm. you're getting hit so much that you can barely keep track of where you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I think that's the kind of um, hindrance that I think works, I think really adds to the atmosphere yeah, of the yeah. game. Um, like every time, my favorite parts of this game are all of the cutscenes that are in that style. Mm. So for reference, the game is, it looks, it's got anime character designs basically. Yeah. Um, but every time it cuts to a cutscene, it's just this like, spectrum of noise and visuals and german words just appearing or just yeah. like quotes coming out of nowhere yeah like it's really really evocative like if you even if you don't want to play this game i would still encourage you to look up its visuals because it just it's really singular and determined in its vision and it really looks like nothing else you briefly mentioned the intro that was a boot up scene yeah the intro so there's there's the intro and then there's one cutscene i think about which is in the it's the it's the intro oh sorry it's the cutscene that kind of transitions the game from its third level to its fourth level Mm -hmm. and i love it it's so cool the only thing i'll say about it is that one of the screens of text that appear just says compartmentalizing trauma Mm -hmm. and i really like that yeah but like on my notes at the top it just has that little screen so i can remember it because it's it really it's really cool Mm. it's part of that blending of the line between what is human and what is replica yeah yeah Um, and there's all these different sources of information and like visual data being transmitted and it doesn't know how to display it all properly so it just corrupts and distorts and things like that Mm. yeah it's it's a it's a fucking great part of the game yeah yeah I do, I do want to draw attention to a few moments where you're kind of in this first person and you're being taken to quite an assortment of different um, surroundings and environments. Yeah, so this is one of the most kind of abstract parts of the story. I mean, they make sense at the end once you realise what they're showing you. Mm-hmm. But there's quite a lot of sections in which Elster will suddenly... Well, the game will cut 
and then you'll suddenly be in first person walking around this kind of PS1 area that doesn't seem linked at all to where you've been or where you were going. Mm-hmm. They're kind of interesting as well. They break up some of the... Like, yeah, because the there's, there's no like actual gameplay in them. They're just mm-hmm. little like scenes where you walk around reading notes or seeing really cool visuals and stuff like that yeah a few of them kind of weirdly captivated me because Mm -hmm. they were looks of the rest of this world and and they and they play off as as something quite important and later on yeah Um, like my favorite is the one where you're in a classroom and mm -hmm. you're walking around this kind of it's very gray and blocky very industrial and you're reading about these notes about characters that you don't know who they are and it's like what, what is the relevance of this and then when you realize what it is it it really makes that scene hit even harder. Yeah, I think I'd say that's the same yeah. for me as well. The classroom is one of my favourites too. Um, I like the radio station as well. Yeah, is that the very beginning? The very you beginning, find... where, you, where you get the radio, yeah. Like, the environments are kind of interesting. I, I think some of it bleeds into that world building a lot. Yeah, like, exactly, yeah. There, there's, some, there's some of the surface level things, like there being posters hung up of different places, and, and they talk and some of the propaganda that's floating around. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one thing I think about is the very beginning of the game when you go into the sleeping quarters and it almost looks like the beds look like they're in cages, mm, right? Yeah. And, and there were, that was near the beginning of the game when the gestalt and replica thing wasn't so clear cut. And I was trying to think to myself, oh God, do, do the people sleep here or is this the way they keep the robots? Cause yeah, yeah. You find a note from someone who works down there who's kind of talking about how things kind of suck now and, and, <laughs> and, and they're being monitored by, by people constantly and the like. Um, and, 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 and there's, and there's this gradual, as the environments go, you think it's going to be, like, I thought it was going to be the sort of classic survival horror thing where it's an utter descent into insanity. You go from this normal world and back down, but it has a few twists and turns, which we'll get into when we get to spoilers, I think, but, um, which I find quite interesting in, in how they're handled. Yeah. I think the thing about the world building for me is that it's all supplemental, but it enhances your understanding of the game's themes and its characters, you know, mm. like there's so much to learn about the world and you don't need to know any of it, but yeah. it really brings out a flavor in that world that I find really fascinating. It's got such good use of contrast and color. Mm. Like everything is so sharp and vivid and there's such a, there's such a division between the light and dark of each world and it's mm. it's really really good to look at yeah i think the art style carries it as well mm. i think if it was going for a semi-realistic look i don't think it would have worked out the same way as it does here. yeah yeah um still probably could have done a good job but a good bit of this sort of identity is this yeah. commitment to the using the lower poly playstation one stuff to lean into a kind of cartoony art style in a few points and blend those together really well yeah um, it's very cohesive yeah, exactly, exactly. Really, really good art direction in general. I realise I have basically no notes about the sound. Yeah, so the sound... Um, I have the Signalis soundtrack on my phone. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, there is no better collection than perhaps Silent Hill 2 of pipes clanging and ethereal dream music that you'll get <laughs> anywhere. Oh my gosh, yeah. The Silent Hill 2 soundtrack is two-thirds of it. Some of the most beautiful, serene, kind yeah. of like chill-out music with that builds this atmosphere and is very emotional. Uh... And then maybe like two or three kind of like rock pop songs. And then, yeah. and then the rest of it is Block Mind, which uh, requires you, no explanation. No. Clearly. Yeah, you know, just someone's tumble dryer and a steam pipe going off. Yeah. So like a lot of the music is very industrial and mm. then it's interspersed with a lot of piano music and a lot of kind of like, like really like soft, gentle tones. Mm. It also has, I was going to say licensed music, but that's not really appropriate. Well, no, but there's... it's like, it's like royalty free music it's like open source music did we did we distinguish that we're talking about signalis again what were we talking about before we're talking about silent hill 2 silent hill 2 oh wait oh, game. sorry i was talking about silent hill 2 oh i was I realized... talking about signalis's music <laughs> yeah um oh no um, i mean this is really indicative of how similar those two games are <laughs> yeah i oh my gosh it's it's not so much licensed music as it is it's like public public domain yeah famous tracks as well it's um, all classical music lots of really good piano tracks that are used to really good effect yeah my favorite is um it's a song on the soundtrack it's called the promise mm-hmm. but and i know it's like it's like concerto number no. five by muzango or whatever yeah it's like some famous classical music and it's mm. being played when you're transitioning from the game's prologue to the game's first level. Mm-hmm. And it's just this really dynamic and interesting assortment of like red visuals with German text showing weird like radio signals and data and things like that. Mm. Or while this really like impactful piano music is playing. And it's just so. I think I actually, when I was playing it, I saved a clip of it on my Switch so I could rewatch it because it's just like. It's doing this and it's like cutting quickly between visuals and it's just a, it's just a signalis and it's like, oh my God, like mm. it really grabbed my attention and it, I really think about it quite a lot. Yeah, really strong opener to the game. Yeah, yeah. 
they play the Moonlight Sonata at one point. They play uh, the Halo 3 soundtrack. Oh my gosh, yeah, there's a there's a song that was in one of the Halo 3 trailers that uh, uh, kind of took me out of it when I heard it, but like still a very impactful piece for what it's being used for. I think that's the promise. Is that the promise? I think it's the promise, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's definitely going to be a famous piece, right? Yeah, exactly, if, if they yeah. were willing to... Yeah, absolutely. We've kind of talked about most of the stuff about this game in general, um, so I'm curious if we want to call this the midpoint of the podcast and go into the more spoiler-heavy stuff. Yes, I believe we shall. We shall indeed. Obviously, as we were saying, this game is quite new, mm-hmm. so we want to be a little careful about spoilers. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to say right now, if you don't want to have this game story spoiled for you, just don't listen to the rest of this podcast. No, I, I will also at that point take an opportunity to say, I think this is a game we both recommend. Yeah, so. I this was my favorite game of last year. I've thought about it like every week since I've played it. Like mm. I would recommend this to anyone. It's it's really something special. Yeah, and in which case then there it's available on all modern platforms. So please go and give it a look. It's on Game Pass, I think. Oh really? Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. So, Fantastic. No excuse not to if you've got an Xbox or a PC. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into it because um, the stuff that's kind of spoiler heavy and kind of more sensitive. It's almost as close as the very beginning. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. When you sort of switch into this sort of first person mode, wandering through this uh this 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 sort of snowy scape. Which... Well, you start off on some kind of crashed spaceship. Mm. Um or some kind of ship of some kind. It's not clear if it's a spaceship, so mm. on and so forth. Mm. But what becomes immediately clear is that your Gestalt commander, whose name is Ariane, is missing. Mm-hmm. And you want to find her. So you begin wandering in this snowy world. Yeah, which um, I somehow got lost in. Yeah, it turns out, because <laughs> I thought you had to move the analog stick to move Elster forward. You mm. have to press A and you'll, like, go forward. Uh... And we didn't realise that for, like, 20 minutes. No. <laughs> um, and and that, that, took, that took us a while. I mean, it was suitable for uh, the kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Lost in this frozen tundra trying to find our wife. Yeah. For finding a sort of an old derelict radio station, crawling through a hole, and finding a small little broadcast station that contains uh, a radio, as well as the King in Yellow. Mm, Which is one of the many pieces of literature that is prevalent throughout the game. Yeah, I mean, how much do you know about the King in Yellow as as a book? I think Dr. White told me about it, but I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it's not one I've read myself. It's one that's been recommended to me by people before, though. Yeah. Um, so specifically, The King in Yellow is not a Lovecraft book, but it's something that inspired Lovecraft. Mm. So much so that uh, Haster, a.k.a. The King of Yellow, is a part of the Lovecraft mythos now. Like, yeah. like HP put it in there himself, I believe, as and it became a part of that mythos. Well, it's an uh, anthology, isn't it? It's like a collection of stories. Yeah. The King in Yellow is a book about a fictional book called The King in Yellow. Yeah. And this mixture of stories that talk about uh, people who have read this book. It has excerpts from this fictional work and how it affects people's lives, as it were, um, inside of it. Um the King in Yellow is one of those Lovecrafty monsters that doesn't prey on people who are mentally vulnerable so much as it preys on people who are creative. Oh, I see. Which I think is very important for the kind of later context of this game. Yeah, when yeah. They talk a bit about uh, the main character and uh, Ariane and how that. I think that ties in together mm, quite yeah, nicely, exactly, which yeah. is a really fun way of going about it. I think also some of the verses in The King in Yellow are like inspire the visuals in this game in a few points yeah so there's a lot of quotes from certain books including the king in yellow like Mm. i think a lot of the puzzles and a lot of the transition sequences where you're in first person have Mm. just notes that are just sections from the king in yellow in it Mm. as well as a few other bits and pieces as well like one of the hp lovecraft novels is referenced in the credits so i think that one as well is part. well that's actually where my favorite quote in the game comes from connor Ah. which i've put on my notes just so i can say it which is Great holes are secretly digged where the earth's pores ought to surface, and things have learned to walk what ought to crawl. <laughs> ah, yeah. fascinating. Mm. Um, I was curious in that case, because I, I, I have to wonder if it's obviously left intentionally vague, yeah. but it makes me think, is that mankind talking about replicants, or is this about something greater that is talking about mankind and its creation? Yeah, it's, it's, all, like, it's a... all very much up to your interpretation. Yeah, and, that, and that's cool. It, yeah. it's, it's not giving you a direct answer. It, it's not dangling the the uh, mystery in front of you and then giving you the solution. This is up to you. Yeah, like, exactly. The, yeah. And, and, and I like interpretive yeah. storytelling like that. So yeah, so you pick up the King in Yellow, and that's actually when the introduction cutscene that I was talking about plays. Mm-hmm. And then once that has ended, you then cut to Elster in a bathroom. And it's like, she's no longer on this frozen planet. She's now in this mining facility called Sapinski, mm. which is on some moon in the galaxy somewhere. 
That's then where the bulk of the game takes place, or very specifically its first two levels, you could Mm -hmm. say, are in that area. And what happens is that you have a photo in your inventory of a woman who looks similar to your wife, Mm. but isn't your wife. She's got a different name, different coloured hair, and a different a different outfit, basically. Yeah. And her name is Alina Sio. Mm. And so the first two levels of the game are Elster trying to find Alina because she's like, well, she looks like my wife. Which she'll do, I guess. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. But she's, she's curious about her. She wants to meet her. So she's exploring this facility, which has recently been afflicted by this disease, trying to find Alina. Yeah. And uh, there aren't many survivors as far as we're no, aware. No, it's about three, I think. <laughs> yeah, this um, very much does, I think, a necessity for these kinds of stories, which is you keep the, the cast members like below very small, yeah. about six or so. Um, and it's got that kind of Silent Hill vibe in which every character you talk to doesn't seem like they're actually talking to you. Mm. They're just talking to something else. Yeah. Like, no one seems to actually be talking to each other. They're all very despondent and confusing and don't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. They They're just... And I think that's kind of a fun way of yeah, uh, yeah. of doing it for this kind of game. And that's when you sort of encounter the weird monsters. And there's not really much known about where these have come from. I assumed that these were going to be like mental manifestations or something. Yeah. And it seems more likely these have been afflict- afflicted by the condition that seems to kind of like be, uh, you know, running rampant in this place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not strictly confirmed in any no, case. that's that's one of those elements that's very much open to interpretation mm. including if any of this is actually even happening mm-hmm. like and how that links to elster yeah and it's it, that's what's kind of very confusing about it is that especially the first time you're playing it you have no idea why you're here or like yeah. what's going on yeah you, uh, like because i i assumed um for one the fact that it transitions so hard from you opening the king in yellow into this space i thought okay something fuck is going here yeah but i could at least reason to some extent that elster has just turned up at the bottom of this facility yeah and and, and this is still part of the same planet but the world building that you can find around around the environment begins to imply that that's not where you are and you seem to be jumping all over the place yeah exactly um that being said sapinski does define much of it you spend a good chunk of the first few chapters effectively trying to find ways down yeah um so like like i know it's i'm gonna say it again connor mm -hmm. Um, it's coming out just Take it off your bingo cards. All right, all right. This is truly a game of two halves. <laughs> I guess it is, yeah. It, it's a plot of two halves. The mm. two halves are Sapinski, this facility, and why it's being afflicted by these zombies, basically. Mm-hmm. And then it's the story of Elsa trying to find Ariane. Mm-hmm. And they're linked to each other in certain ways, especially thematically, mm. but they're not directly tied to one another. Yeah. I wasn't. I didn't even pick up that these were particularly meant to be intertwined stories mm. for a while, and it didn't make much sense to me until we got to the very end. Yeah, yeah. Um, but perhaps Silent Hill Two does just condition me into thinking, uh, you know, someone's just someone looking for their wife. They just won't question it. Yeah, they'll yeah. just they'll just be like, all right, well, I'll find my wife. <laughs> Look, is she in this mine? Have you seen this girl? Where's my wife at? If I was a miner and someone showed me a picture of their wife and said, "Have you seen her?" I'd be like, "Was she a rock?" Yeah. Because then I then no, I haven't, idiot. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so I think the best thing to do would be to talk about the sp- the, the, the Sapinski part of the story and then mm-hmm. lead that into why it connects to Elster's story later. Yes. So yeah. the notes that you find, um, especially around a character whose name is Adler, who's kind of like the second in command of this facility, mm. is that people are beginning to experience memories that aren't their own. And they don't understand why or what's causing it or what effect it's going to have. And that's quite interesting. Mm. I think that's... Um, my interpretation of that would be that it's to do with the how replicas are meant to have this kind of imprint of yeah, another person yeah. on them. Um, which is very interesting when they're given... You know, you get the psychological profiles of who these people were and you'd assume that these were kind of taken into more consideration. But clearly whatever is going on is showing that that is not the case yeah, and that yeah. replicas are far more fragile of a thing than yeah, the yeah. then the kind of authoritarian regime wants them to be they i think the i in my opinion i think the regime wants the replicas to be uh tools of the state yeah and yeah. they're 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 really not they're just as much people as uh like gestalts are although it is interesting to note that the whatever is happening to this place just straight out straight out kills gestalts mm. like there are no living gestalts on this planet anymore they are all dead and the replicas are still technically alive mm. but the last remnant of whatever humanity was doing here yeah yeah um and and there's also despite there being the clear influences this is meant to be a kind of soviet inspired place and they've got the east german thing going on 
No mention of Earth, really. Uh, no, yeah, it's, yeah. It's 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 a very sci-fi area of of the universe. Yeah, uh, that nothing's particularly points to that being the case. Like there are always little hints towards the nature of this like monolithic empire that these that the nation of Yusan is fighting, mm. but it's never confirmed. Like, where is the center of that government? What is their structure? Why did they break away? Like, what's mm. actually going on there? Yeah, you just hear about a handful of planets that yeah. exist in this place, and that's really where the story is taking place. Is yeah, is yeah. on a, like. Maybe only two or three of them, actually. Yeah, I think it's Sapinski and Rockfront. Rockfront. Oh, yeah. they're only the two. Yeah, 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 yeah. That checks out. Oh, and the the planet that the Penrose is on. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, undisclosed. Undisclosed planet, yeah. Um, but, yeah. So a lot of the time, um, Elster is willing to just kind of descend on her own accord. She finds a giant meat grinder at some point and just says, yeah, Jumps I'll go it. down there. Yeah, she's very much got that James Sunderland from Silent Hill 2 thing where she's just She's just delving deeper and deeper into this facility, and she's mm. like, "I will find my wife or die," and that is it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, truly committed. Get get yourself a partner that is that <laughs> committed to you as Elster is yeah, to yeah. Ariane, and you end up having at some point a boss fight with one of the mining robots, which we've mentioned earlier. Yeah, I really like that as a boss fight as well. Um, and there's also a point at some point where you actually meet Adler face to face. One of the few instances where Elster meets another replica in 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 you know the same room as her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think. So it's it's Adler. There's Alina or Leo, or whatever she's called. She's got like a different name. Yeah. Um, there's the there's a miner that you can find in the mine who is like, I'm dying, bro. Yeah. That's stupid. I'd give you my laser, but you're yeah. too small to carry it. And then there's like, there's a Calibri that you find and then two people also in the mines who don't even talk to you. Mm. Um, and I think that might be it in terms of actual cast other than Ariane. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which is, which is quite tight. Yeah. Um, but um, you meet Adler and he... Oh, fuck, he's 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 not having a good day at work. <laughs> like the thing about Adler is that he is a administrator and he mm. is designed to be the second in command of a facility mm. uh, underneath a commander. Yeah. Um, and the thing about him is that because of that, he's like I want to call him like he's like he's got he's got such bottom energy because he <laughs> his his entire soul is to be a subordinate to someone above him. Yeah. So he's like very prim and proper and professional. Mm. Like even when you find him for the first time, he's like. Oh, welcome to our facility. I'm very professional. Mm. And then he pushes you down a lift. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and what's um, interesting about what breaks your fall, Connor? Oh, um, which is that when you fall down to the bottom of this pit, you find a pile of you. Yeah, like, apparently he's just been pushing hundreds of Elsters down this elevator. <laughs> yeah, another reminder that you're not a unique yeah. creature. Like, yeah. like, there are multiple of you that exist out you're there. You're mass-produced, basically. Yeah. And things become a lot more isolated at this point. Like, like there's, there's, there's a lot less hope that you're going to find anyone particularly friendly down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was got, at, at the very least. That was the turning point for me on that front, and that was before things really, you know, like fall apart, as it were. Yeah. Um, I think this is the floor uh, where you do find like the radio station that transmits a particular song as yeah, one such yeah. thing. So it's like uh, the first area is like a residential area where you're going through a bunch of sleeping quarters and a hospital and things like that. Yeah. And then when Adela pushes you down the elevator, you're in like a, you're in like the structure above the mine where mm. there's a bunch of machinery and engines and things like that. It's much more industrial mm. rather than residential. Yes, yeah, which which makes a lot of sense given the operation. Yeah, yeah. The notes that you find also begin to point to how things are not going particularly well on this ex- expedition. Yeah. And uh, people are starting to lose their shit. It's a good progression uh, as well, because you go from like a very comfortable living space mm. to an industrial, like rusty metal area mm. which then leads into the third area which we'll get to in a bit but i like it as a kind of like visual progression of going deeper into this place and getting further away from comfort and safety mm. yeah yeah further into peril yeah exactly um, and, and the unknown which and like some parts of the area are like flooded or like machinery isn't working properly like it's really mm. starting to just fall apart yeah very good way of cohesively tying together um the fact that um you know this is a particularly dangerous job that isolates you from the comforts yeah, of, yeah. Of, of things and and you feel that as a player and that's how it's meant to be in the world yeah um especially since like the the enemy threats as well become a lot become a lot more prevalent they become uh more numerous yeah there's uh, a section in this area that i really like where you have to drop down a hole into mm-hmm. like a lower floor for a, re- for a hole in the ceiling and it's like you drop down there and it's really dark and there are so many enemies and you're just like, oh, I don't know where I am. Where yeah. is the safe room? I'm just trying to desperately cast your way out of there. Mm, and I, re- yeah. I really like it. There's a real frantic dash yeah, and, yeah. Uh, when you eventually have to get that flashlight equipped on you, which, again, that takes another fucking infantry slot. It does, yeah. Um, it's a huge pain. Like, that's the only way you can really progress normally. Yeah. 
it turns out you actually need that flashlight for another obstacle mm. in the game. Well, I think we've said all that we could say about the mining area. Mm. So should we talk about the mines? <laughs> Yeah, the mines themselves. Uh, to my surprise, the shortest area in the game. Uh, yeah, the mines isn't really a level. It's more just a you're going to somewhere from the mines. Mm. And um, and and it still manages to be interesting yeah. though. Um, like there's there's it, they look very samey, so you can get a little bit turned around as to where you're going. And I kind I think, of like that. I think the game is actually isometric in the mines. Oh, like yeah, it, actually, it's at yeah. that forty five degree angle. Yeah, because everything. Yeah, every path is yeah, is yeah. at an angle. Um, you get into that weird room where you find some of those uh, NPCs you mentioned that exist but are not talking to you at all. Yeah, I think uh, one of them is just freaking out and having a panic attack. Yeah. And the other one is, like, trying to talk cheerfully to try and reassure them. It's a really interesting conversation. Yeah. Because he's just like, oh, yeah, we could just do this thing or we could talk about this normal topic. And the other one's just like, uh, uh. Yeah. Which um, which is in the the VibroWire mm, room, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, which is... Uh, that fucked me up. <laughs> yeah. Like gameplay wise, um, they 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 fucking like. I think I, I don't think it was this room. It was a later room. I went from not dying once throughout the entire game to being killed like six times. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like these rooms that are shrouded in darkness, and like there's like a path you can walk through a room full of wire, mm. and walking into the wires killed you, and we didn't realize that, so we just kept walking into the wire. Yeah, I mean, like, why am I dying? Nothing's yeah. attacking me, and then yeah, it was the fucking wires. And then in my favourite survival horror trope, you get to the end of the mines and you have to jump down a very deep hole. Uh Uh-huh. And that leads into the third area in the game, which is called Nowhere. Nowhere. Um... So Nowhere is where the kind of... I know that we've been talking about travelling in possible spaces and the kind of abstract dreaminess to the game thus far, but Nowhere is when this kicks into, like, third gear. Mm -hmm. Like, Nowhere makes no sense. Like, it's like, you go into rooms... Like, you leave a room from the right, and then you enter the next room going down. Like, you just teleport all over the place. Like, Mm. there are no physical boundaries or rules that really govern nowhere. It is just, like, a fugue dream space. Yeah, and, and like, I think at first it's a a couple of, like, weirdly rusty rooms, but Mm. then it becomes uh, the meat planet. Yeah, just the gestating, pulsing flesh everywhere. Yeah, the enemies become a bit more fucked up as well. Like, in some cases, I actually found them legitimately dread-inducing, uh, partly because I'd be low on resources and I wasn't sure how to combat the threat. But yeah. in several other circumstances, it'd be just because they genuinely look creepy. Mm. Um, I mean, you can't map nowhere either. No, you can't. Yeah. Uh, you get turned around. Nothing makes any real logical sense. You you can go to you can go through a doorway that's on your left and end up coming down from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you get all just completely turned around in this place. But that's sort of the point. And yeah. To my pleasant surprise, I didn't have too hard of a time actually navigating it. No, I think they slightly accommodate for the lack of a map by making it a simpler area. It's mm. not. It's, it's, there's not as many flaws to it, and it's not as complex as the other areas are. Another fun use of the radio as well is like you you have to switch the frequency to get these particular patterns on a monitor. Oh and, yeah, because they give you yeah. key key combinations for doors and stuff. Yeah, and they actually tell you what the yeah the, the key combos, and that's yeah. that's and that's like a really fun way of using it. And uh, that's also where you encounter our poor friend who is dealing with a, a big, fleshy, messy problem with the rifle that she can barely handle. Yeah, that's when uh, you find Isa, I think her name is Isa. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, like that's, that, was, that, was a, that was a pretty fun little boss fight as well. Cause, yeah, because um, it basically it's about waiting for Isa to finally stand up and shoot it with the rifle. Mm. Um, which I think it's like the pyramid head fight in Silent Hill 2. Oh, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Where you don't actually need to shoot them, but it makes it quicker. Yeah. Like, it makes her stand up faster if you shoot it. Mm, but, like, build the confidence in, which I think I would like that scene a bit more if Isa was a bit more of a character mm. and if if we had if we had met her prior, like, in, in a few places and learnt that this was a flaw that she had. But at the same time... I think time, we had met Isa. Mm. Like, she was in a few rooms, but obviously her dialogue was also abstract. It's hard to know what she's really like. Yeah. 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 And I would, have my, I would have liked it a bit more if this was sort of the culmination of some arc she was going yeah. down. Yeah. As far as I recall, unless we did something wrong, I don't think we see her again. I think she's the girl who melts. Oh, she is, isn't she? Yeah, yes, yeah. my mistake. Um, well, that's actually something about the game that I have a slight flaw with, is that obviously like, you're meant to be trying to find Alina, right? And she, the whole thing is that she looks like your wife. And that it's confusing, and that's like the mystery of it all. Mm-hmm. But like I, the characters in this game are all anime girls. Mm. Like they're all very yeah. anime women, yeah. like with the with the hair and the eyes and stuff like yeah. that. So I actually didn't realize that wasn't my wife. 
I was just like, oh yeah, that's she is with the brown hair. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, you could have fooled me as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I just assumed, like, because we were kind of laying that joke on a bit thick while we were playing. I just assumed anyone we were meeting was our wife. Yeah. Like, By God, my wife, I found you. Oh, no, wait, you're... Uh... Like, they're all like young, pretty women. Yeah. So it can be hard to distinguish between all of them at a certain point. Yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, that's that sort of comes from the art style you choose. Yeah, um, yeah. Nowhere was quite good fun, all things considered. So but... Nowhere is actually my least favorite area in the game. Oh, like really? By, by a considerable distance. Mm. I, ha- I have two issues with it. The first is that the quantity of enemies really started to grind me down a little bit. Like, there's just so many of them, and it mm. became frustrating to have to deal with them all. Yeah. This is actually the point in the game where I dropped the difficulty down to easy. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. yeah I, I just became tired of it. Mm. Which that was a uh, that's quite a uh, a jump as well because you go from enemies requiring like you know five or six sort of hits to, to kill like two to to, to two yeah. sometimes one if you're lucky yeah. uh, and that and and it sort of changes the whole pacing of the game as yeah. well um, but the um, but uh, you're a lot more fond of the um... well I didn't do my second issue. Oh, did you not? Sorry, yeah. go ahead. My second issue is that it's just too much like a nightmare world from Silent Hill. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's just entirely that aesthetic of the rust and the blood and like the mysterious dream world where mm. it becomes so close to Silent Hill that I'm just bored of it. But mm. like, that's not an interesting visual to me. It's like, oh, it's the Silent Hill world. I understand. Yeah, I think I was more I was a little bit more okay with it because I think the thing I like about it by comparison is the thing I associate a lot more with something like say Silent Hill Three. Yeah, is that it is this sort of bloodied nightmare world that's full of rust and everything, but. I associate it more with things being covered in stuff like that rather yeah. than being consisting of them. Okay. Whereas I find that um, uh, Nowhere kind of layers on the kind of bio-horror a bit more. Yeah. Where you have these big fleshy, like, amorphous holes and, and, and like, these chunks of them that, like, are, like, covering over doors and things. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that more because it feels more like an organism that is living and growing rather than something that, in my mind, is dying or wounded. Okay, which is, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's the way I see Silent Hill 3. No, I get you, Cause, yeah. Because, um, you know, fucking Alyssa is dying. Um, not talking about Clock Tower, Alyssa. <laughs> that's a confusing thing, but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so you get to the end of Nowhere, and Nowhere doesn't actually have a boss outside of that little cage guy that you fight with Isa, and that's not even at the end of the section. Mm. What happens at the end of Nowhere is that you reach the bottom of the facility, mm. and here is where the game begins to just go, like... It's very cool, but also very confusing. Basically, mm. you come to like this like red void world, and there's a bunch of obelisks and pillars like dotted across the horizon. Mm. And Elster walks up these stairs, and at the top of them is Adler. Mm. And Adler, he's trying to stop you from going through the arc, and he talks about how the commander of the facility went through there and was never the same again, and that's where all these troubles began. Mm. And he really desperately wants you not to go into that area. Obviously, you ignore him. And Elster begins walking through this through this region, and it's really striking. Like I've actually got mm. my notes for the first time. Actually, have pictures from Signalis because mm. I, I just wanted to be reminded of the visuals. But I've got one here of the arc that Adler's standing by, and it's really, really cinematic. Yeah. And then at the end of this area, you find the Penrose, which is the ship you were in at the start of the game. Yeah. You then <laughs> Elster tries to climb up it, mm. and it looks kind of silly because she's like jumping up this big ship. And she tries to pull the hatch open, and then her arm breaks. Yeah. And she just falls off the ship. And then the game's over. Oh, yeah, you just get booted right back to the... To no, the you end. get credits. You get credits, you get, yeah. You get the credits, and the game is like, you did it, congratulations. If that's, 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 the, that's the end, that's what happens to Elsa, she doesn't <laughs> quite make it. Um, and you're just like, oh, damn. At which point I went... Oh well, shit, that was the end of Signalis. Um, you know what? I've noticed there's a manual button. I'm going to yeah. read the manual. And then it booted me into the game again. <laughs> yes, because that is not the end of the game. There's actually an entire other section. No, I think it wanted me to press continue, but yeah. it was uh, it was still a really cool moment of, mm. oh shit, there's more game. Yeah. Um, so you then find yourself on the Penrose, but the Penrose is actually in orbit. It's flying. It's not crashed. Mm. And there is where you learn how Ariane falls into this story and what her kind of purpose is. Mm-hmm. So basically, Ariane is a gestalt, or well, she's a normal woman, I guess. She's a human woman, mm. just like we all are. Um, and she has a backstory in which she lived on Rotfront, one of the worlds occupied by Yusan, and she was basically pressed into military service like all children are, and she was bullied at school, and she didn't like her life, so she signed up to be enlisted in a program called the Penrose Program, Mm -hmm. and what that is is that you're sent into this ship into the distant galaxy, 
and you're just trying to scan for inhabitable planets. And you have an Elsa unit with you to help you with that, but you're not meant to talk to her. Yeah. And that's Ariane's mission. So this section of the game sees you on the Penrose with Ariane, and it reveals that that's when it's basically revealed that they are lovers basically that they're friends like yeah like like there's a clear partnership to them like like you could argue that it's a friendship but i think i think there's definitely romantic implications yeah, like yeah. they like like they dance together and and, and yeah when you find her at the end she kisses her on the head yeah, yeah. and everything like that it, yeah. it's uh, it's 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 definitely like and they and she also talks about like like showing um like elster Ariane talks about showing elster like particular films and, yeah, and listening and, to music and yeah. stuff like that and uh, Ariane uh, is an artist and she paints and things like that which king and yellow yeah there you uh, go just, yeah. uh, that's that's what i think is is the the tie together with that and you you go through this decrepit ship i think you also find a bunch of notes that talk about like how like she's failed to to help elster yeah because Elster's obviously not- there's like there's a really great note that I think we kept referencing after we saw it, where it's like, no, wh- whatever you do, don't befriend your Elster. <laughs> oh yeah, there's like there's a guide in the um the guy the guides the psychological profile for Elsters talk about how like you do you do not form emotional attachments to Elsters. They are basically like a a house servant. Just do not g- interact with them. Yeah, like they're, they're loners. The, yeah, like don't talk to them. Yeah, they do not get on with people. Like and and, and just leave them be. Yeah. Um. I also think back to another note as well that also says uh, on a completely opposite end of things, uh, do not eat your robot. No, uh, it might look like delicious human flesh. but yeah, yeah, we must warn people that if you are ever thinking of resorting to cannibalism and think robots don't count as people, no, the robots are not good to eat. Do not eat the replica organs. They the are... robot can eat you yeah. safely. Appar- yeah, apparently yeah. that's fine. But you can't eat the robot. <laughs> Which is, oh boy. Yeah, so you move through the ship and you dance with Ariane and it's all very sweet. And then it cuts back to a decrepit version of the ship and Elster drops in through this window and she finds like a dead Elster, Mm. like lying on the ground. And she like pulls off that Elster's arm and puts it onto herself and like equips its chassis and things like that. Yeah, which is, um, they they kind of make that a bit of a montage as well Mm. about how like she needs to complete. Oh yeah, I mean that cutscene where it transitions from the Penrose section to the next part of the game, that's like my favourite part of the game. Yeah. (laughs) Like that's where it says compartmentalising trauma. There's all these different visuals and scenes and a bunch of pictures and it's really, really, it's it's really visually stunning. You know, it looks incredible. I love it. Mm. Yeah. And that's when you end up into the final section of the game, Rotfront. Yes. Uh, good old scenic Rotfront. Ro- uh, scenic Rotfront, which is, as we learned from the Penrose section, the planet that Ariane is from. Yeah, and uh, frankly, I have to say, it's very refreshing to have a final area in these types of games that isn't supposed to be a nightmare world yeah. or a or a stale clean- clinic facility. It's like you've gone back to like a small town and there's a bunch of like little local shops and like a subway station mm. and... You learn, you read all these notes about Ariane's childhood and some friends that she had, and it's very, it's very unique. I really, really like it too. It is. It isn't. To, it isn't to say that it isn't still perilous. It's mm. still got like higher, higher end enemies and 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 the like, um, as well as something I what we tend to notice, which is that as you progress through that area, certain passages are blocked off by uh, weird pulsating massive masses of tunnels meats. of flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that you can't go through anymore. Um, and 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 it's 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 honestly it's a very cool sort of end section as well. Yeah, it's where a few of the side side characters you meet also kind of meet their end. You you find out that uh um what what, what was she called? Ali Eli Issa Issa. Yeah. That's it. Um, like it turns out she was looking for someone who was born the same day as her. Yeah, it's her sense. sister. Yeah, yeah, her sister. And uh, I I think the implication is that her sister was dead. Yeah, and she yeah. wasn't able to find her before she too succumbs to the disease in Sapinski. Yeah. Um, and it's like you go into a room and you just start saying things like I'm sorry I just can't go on I can't find my sister and she just melts yeah she just melts into a puddle and, yeah. and, and, and Elster... she becomes part of the corruption yeah and El- Elster like watches this happen and, and for a moment I think she tries to help but mm. like in a very slow kind of how do I help I yeah want to like she something. looks horrified mm. like she's just like oh my god like this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life yeah like, like no, no fucking shit yeah I don't know what more what, what more I can say about Rockfront mm. other than that you know we 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 rock point we we rock <laughs> I can't say we rock front, front hard and we, we rock, rock front, front long <laughs> rock front long <laughs> yeah I mean compared to the other planets no one can compare yeah. rock front rock front that's my that's where that's where I plant my flag I love like rock front I don't even remember what the other ones are called there was Leng there's Helmet rock front Helmet yeah Kitsa Venetia yeah and others 
others. Yeah. yeah. Who, which, yeah. which one had the star in it? I don't know. Whatever. I think it was High Matt. High, High Matt was the yeah, star? Yeah. yeah. High Matt was the star, yeah. Got some warm feelings for High Matt. You know, there's no place like High Matt, but Rock Front, <laughs> there's definitely no place like Rock Front. Yeah, for me, Rock Front is up there with the Silent Hill 2 Historical Society or the Silent Hill 3 hosp- no, Hospital, no, Silent Hill 3 Church level. Oh. It's just like. I beat Rockfront in like one sitting because I was so gripped by it. I just wanted to keep going and I had so much fun. It's so visually striking. It's so interesting. You learn so many interesting things about the world. And it's 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 super engaging. I mean, fuck damn. Yeah. Like, like I, I love this game a lot. Like, <laughs> no, no, no kidding. As you yeah. say, this was your favorite of last year. Yeah. Um, favorite of many of the last years, I think it would say. I think it, really? it goes up there. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, it might be con- contender, contender for game of the decade if we <laughs> jump this, this far ahead. Uh... No, it's not as good as Final Fantasy XIV. So, <laughs> yes, that's true. Unfortunately, a game, yeah. A game from 2013. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, oh, <laughs> right, yeah, shit. Yeah, we're in a new decade, baby. Oh, my God. That just broke my head. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm destabilizing now. Oh, shit. Do not remind Ash of how quickly time is passing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my that's my pattern that I need. Yeah, make sure that Ash doesn't break by giving her Final Fantasy supplements. And, and, uh... <laughs> supplements? <laughs> yeah, it's you, like brain force. Yeah, you, 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 give a, you give little chunks of Final Fantasy discs. To yeah. You. <laughs> All right, Ash, you can play 30 minutes of Final Fantasy X. Oh, wow. It's the Blitzball bit. <laughs> oh, my favorite. Oh, I hate that part. <laughs> Sorry, I promise the next 30 minutes afterwards will be better. Uh, yeah, so... After going through Rot Front, you go through the tunnel again, mm. and you end up at the King and Yellow broadcasting station yet mm. again. Yeah. Although I do feel at this point you have learned that all of the the 3D transition sequences that are in first person, you learn that they are either of areas that Ariane has painted, or they're memories from her childhood Mm. for instance the snowy radio station in the mountains is actually where she was posted as a radio engineer for a few years of her life oh right and the school is where she grew up and where she was bullied yeah that that makes a lot of sense yeah Yeah. and then like the the kind of beach setting where it's like there's an island off in the distance that's actually Mm. one of ariane's paintings Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I also want to mention they talk about on Rockfront that there's a particular uh, on that so there's a particular natural phenomenon. Oh, bioresonance. Yeah, yeah. that that, um, that causes that it, it looks like the sky has like an eye on, mm. in it in it from like from like I believe it's like a, I think it's like a moon eclipsing a sun. Well, they're talking about like how people see patterns and things. Yes, uh, I'm surprised they don't mention like raw shark tests yeah, yeah. because it's the same idea, but yeah. it, it's it's that kind of thing. Great puzzle as well, by the way. The fact they make you look for those patterns and something, that's it's a great, great bit. Yeah, it's really, really inventive. Um, but that like that explains why it's so abstract as yeah. well. Um and and I really like that angle of uh so, like you, you look into someone's past and not just their reality, but also the fiction and, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the art that they've made. Yeah, because there's all these little hints that you are not the first Elster who has been searching for Ariane. Mm. Like there was an Elster who was Ariane's, who was Ariane's companion, mm. and you're not that Elster. Yeah. And like all the times in which you're transitioning dramatically from section to section is you playing as a new Elster mm-hmm. who is who still remembers the promise that she made to Ariane and is trying to find her still. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a really really cool bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the uh, ending. Uh, however, what we saw a little yeah. bit earlier today was uh, particularly profound. And it's where some of the sort of stranger parts of this game kind of tie together, yeah. which was when uh, Falk really yes. comes into play. So you go back through this little tunnel and you get a really funny um, last save room. Mm. I think it's meant to be Ariane's room. Mm, when, I think that's the implication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you get this note that's like, Ariane, it's me, your aunt. Remember to leave one space in your inventory for the final boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as as you do, yeah. Oh, um, I'm gonna throw. Uh, gonna say they should have learned that lesson from Resident Evil, which is always have a mandatory item that you've got to pick up. You've got yeah, to pick yeah. up uh, to fill that space out for the final battle, because that's what RE one and RE two do perfectly. Yeah, is they yeah. Give you that. But then you so you're going up this corridor and you're reading a bunch of notes. Some of them are from Adler and some of them are from Falk, who is the commander of the facility. Yeah. And Adler's ones are all like, I feel like. He's like he's like talking about how does everything is repeating like he's stuck in some kind of loop and every single time the thing loops something changes and how long will it be until it's all just noise and nothing nothing makes sense anymore mm-hmm. um, and then Adler is talking not Adler sorry uh, Falk is talking about how she is beginning to see Elster's memories mm. and she's she's finding it hard to distinguish between what are her memories and what are Elster's like yeah. who is she as a person and who is Elster and whether the, when does that line begin to blur. 
Yeah, because I'm pretty sure where Falk is resting, you do go into a room like that earlier in the game with yeah, someone resting yeah. in that same kind of hospital bed. Yeah. Um, is that is that while assisting one of the side characters, or is that... Um... It is while assisting one of the side characters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And effectively, the boss fight is her saying that in that confrontation, the two of you are going to become a part of each other. Well, I think and... one, of, one of her last notes is like, these memories are mine now. They yeah. are just as valuable to me as they are to the real Elster. Mm. Yeah. And and she also, as I think she might have just said it, but um, she talks about how you've apparently thrown yourself at her so many times to keep progressing. And yeah, she's not yeah. going to let that happen, which I guess kind of might explain away all the Elster units that you've seen prior yeah, in yeah. the game. And... and like Adler always says to you, the first time you meet him, he says you shouldn't have returned. Yeah. 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 That's which is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Like, what the what do you mean returned? Like, I was, I've never been here. I don't yeah. know what Sapinski is. What the uh, hell does Sapinski? Do I do I do I have a history here that I've just the players just not been yeah, told? Yeah, nah, mate. It's uh, it's the time loops, baby. Time loops. It's it's a, it's a that's a small. I took it as a meta thing, and I think that's a subtler way of doing meta than I I was worried about. Yeah. Like, if they had laid it on too thick, if they tried to pull like a like I don't know an Undertale or something, then I would have maybe have been a bit nah. Yeah, about like if it. the game made you like reload a save or something like that, they'd be like, look, you're looping. Yeah. Something like that. But then like she has some really good dialogue. Like she's like. Why do you keep doing this? You know she doesn't want to dance with us anymore. Like, she doesn't even want us. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We're just talking about Ariane, basically. Yeah. Uh, you then fight her in this big, dumb, dramatic battle where she's like this big flesh mound with like a halo around her and she throws spears at you. Yeah, you've got to pick up the spears, then attack her, yeah. and then stab her with the spears. And it's very busy as a fight. There's a lot of shit going on. Like, your screen is being distorted to the point where it's difficult to know where you are. Yeah. My weapons of choice ended up being uh, the rifle and the revolver. Yeah. Uh, opening up with the revolver for the first bits of the of the fight and then for the second round uh using the rifle for the rest yeah. of it uh in, in order to just deal very heavy one hits yeah, whenever yeah. i whenever i could get past the fucking shields yeah exactly um so then when you beat falk the sh she basically like falls to the ground and says ah oh, now we are one again mm. kind of implying that because you've killed her she lives on in you and she's no longer getting that disparity between herself and, Fo and elster yeah like she's like oh we're one person again thank god for that Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's interesting. Because uh, you didn't ever see Falk's memories. No, you know nothing about who Falk is yeah. other than, I think, a couple of notes that... In... Yeah, she's the commander. Like, mm. Adler loves her, basically. He's, like, designed to love her. Mm. I want to mention this about Adler as well, is the fact that um, he he's falling apart mm, in yeah. a very literal sense. Like, you meet him uh, at the archways. He's, like, missing his parts of his face and things. Well, he, he... talks about how the commander went through the archway and never and, and came back and she was never the same again mm. and i think the implication is that the commander going into that area is what triggered her getting elster's memories mm. um so he i think he's like trying to guard it basically because he's realized that's what's causing the universe to keep resetting oh so do you think the wounds are from the other elsters mm. trying to get through yeah yeah mm, but there, there, there is also the part where that lady stabs him in the face Yes, yeah, and he tries. Uh, he tries to do the same to, uh, to yeah, Elster. Because yeah. uh, like, after you kill Folk, you end up again at the at the archway, mm. and Adler's like, "No, you can't go through there. You'll destroy everything." And it, mm. it starts doing a really interesting thing where he has his normal dialogue, and then the game will cut to one of its like text things that it does, but it's still his dialogue mm. where he's like, "You're a selfish monster. You'll destroy everything," and it's, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah, and I never quite followed what he meant by that. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's still a very poignant, poignant yeah. kind of like part of it. I think what I interpret it is that, as he was saying in his note, every time the universe resets, something's changing. Mm -hmm. And he thinks eventually everyone will become noiseless mess, basically. Uh, yeah. I see, yeah. I mean, honestly, fair. Be a guardian of, of form. Yeah. A guardian of, like, any... You have to protect of... the bug timeline. The bug timeline. The bug timeline? The, the bug, bug timeline. The bug timeline. Yeah, yeah, or the prison break timeline. By God, this is a... This is this is one for the for the long term fans. When we get to episode thirty and we finally talk about Bug Island, <laughs> you'll finally know what we mean. Yeah. So you um, you end up going through the archway. Um, Adler tries to stop you and mm -hmm. he stabs you in the eye, which I always really find amusing because I like to think he's like, well, it worked on me, and he stabs her in the eye, but then she just shoots him in the face, <laughs> and he's like, oh shit. Well, I guess the gun truly yeah. is mightier than the sword. You then find your way back to the Penrose and this time you find yourself able to open the hatch at the, at the top of it mm. gaining access it's there where you then find the game's last series of notes mm -hmm. and what they say is that if the person on the Penrose exhibition ex expedition 
never finds a planet it is expected that they will die in space. Yeah. Like the ship, you'll eventually run out of rations and spare parts and the radiation shielding in the ship will break. Yeah. And that is what has happened in this situation. And Ariane has been very slowly dying of radiation poisoning. Yeah. Um. I mean, they like, I think they, they talk about the character's hair going white and, mm, and getting yeah. older. And like she's and like, like losing her teeth and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and I, I, wasn't quite sure what was going on there especially given you've got the picture of the other girl that's meant to look vaguely like Ariane yeah, and, yeah. but her hair is brown and, and the white hair thing I don't know if Ariane just had white hair or if the white hair is a result of the radiation and the aging I think she does have white hair mm. I think her hair's falling out rather than it's turning white yeah yeah. which that yeah those are definitely signs of radiation poisoning yeah I mean case. you actually find a room where there's like radiation leaking into the ship yeah, and your Geiger counter goes off yeah reading that note while the Geiger counter is going off definitely adds a lot yeah uh, yeah in, yeah in, in, in that circumstance but... and then you also find yourself yeah there's, yeah. A, there's a you in there and it's implied that that is the original actual Elster who was friends of Ariane mm. because you look at her and you say like Elster will say I couldn't keep my promise to her I died like I, I didn't live on for her mm. um, obviously implying that else the units have now been filled with this desire to do what this one had promised basically yeah and go find the prim- the, yeah. the the primrose it's the penrose the penrose yeah yeah, yeah. my god how did i forget that you said that like 12 <laughs> times um so then you go into the final room in the game where ariana is mm. um and this is the point at which the game has several different endings so i guess we'll just go through them one by one yeah certainly because we've we this was one of them yeah uh, yeah so the one we got is called memory and Ariane, oh sorry, um, Elster goes into the room and Ariane's in this like cryopod, I guess. She's in this weird like chemical bath looking thing. Mm. And Elster approaches the tank and she looks upon Ariane and she kisses her on the forehead and kind of stares longingly at her. And doesn't really know what to do, I suppose. Mm. And then Ariane wakes up and Elster says, El- oh, Ariane, it's me, Elster. Do you remember? And she doesn't remember you. Mm. Like she, she's, she's so ill at this point that she doesn't even have any memory of who you are. And Elster just falls to the ground behind her and just says, let me stay with you a mm. little longer. Mm. And then they both basically bleed out, I feel. Elster bleeds out and then Ariane continues being in this pod. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and that one that one's quite poignant. It's like yeah, it's, it's like very a, touching, yeah. It's an ending of loyalty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. in a way. And, and also Elsa just being like, I fought so hard just to be with you again. I'm just gonna stay here. Even if you don't remember me. Yeah. Like, I just wanna be here. Yeah, probably like I, I feel like that's that's heartbreaking at mm. the worst and kind of bittersweet at the best in, in many ways. It's interesting because Elsta is very quiet as a character. She doesn't talk very much or express much emotion. Mm. But by the end of the game you'll feel so sorry for her. Because mm. obviously she is designed to be a loner, but she had her heart opened by her interactions with this girl. Mm. And then she's trying so hard to get back to her and then things go the way that they do. And it just really, I really empathize with Elsa. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredibly powerful scene. Yeah. Especially uh, when she just, she like, she like lays down next to the tank and she puts her head there and she's just like, I'm just going to die here. Like mm. this is, this is all like all I could get really. Mm. The end of the journey, you just got to, mm. yeah, fucking hell. Uh, it's of- like, the game will sometimes like, cut to 2d like it's like a visual novel background where it's the character reacting to something mm. and all the ones at the end of elster it just kind of tears your heart out because she looks so defeated oh yeah like well that's the thing i wouldn't say there's a particularly good ending to this game mm, yeah uh, in, in some way or another there is some kind of like like uh darker spark to it yeah, uh, yeah. in many ways uh i do think the i mean if unless you count the kind of fake out ending at the uh that you get near the yeah, in the middle. Yeah, yeah, in the yeah. middle. After after um, nowhere. I'd say that the the worst ending is probably the next one after this. Is this is... Um, promise or escape? Uh, the one where she just can't go. Yeah, into the so Penrose. it's you get to that room. Well, you can get into the Penrose, but you get to Ariane's room, and then Elster says, "I just can't do it. Mm. I can't face her again. She, she, her nerve fails her, and she. It's interesting because she she leaves the Penrose, but she's no longer in a void. Mm. She's in like a nor- like a blue sky in this desert." where yeah. the Penrose has crashed. Um, and she just wanders off and she falls to the ground and like assumes the fetal position mm. and just lies there and slowly bleeds to death. Mm. And like, I, I, I do agree it's probably the worst, but I do still really like it. I, I don't mean in worst in terms of quality. I mean worst in terms of like, like the outcome. darkest. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. uh, like it has this really beautiful shot where Elster is lying on the ground and then like there's so much empty space to the left of her, kind mm-hmm. of implying that she's just completely alone and she has nothing. Yeah. And, 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 and again, like, 
heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? like, she looks so uh, upset. Yeah. I just want to like tussle her on the head or something. Mm. It feels like the closest to that uh, else. The fact that you go into like a blue sky with a desert makes it seem like that's the closest that Elsa gets to reality. Yeah, yeah. And in that front, you know, that's fuck. That's sad. Yeah, you know? yeah. It probably means that uh, you know her relationship with Ariane was just like the best of it was gone. Yeah. When yeah. when the original unit failed, you know, like Jesus. you can never go back, man. Like the, 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 those else units are fucking doomed to live in this kind of cycle. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a way, um, but and then there's then there's the uh, the secret ending. Uh, the oh no, there's there's the third ending. There's a third one. There's promise. It's promise. Yeah. Prom- oh, of course, there's promise. Of promise course. is you go to the you get into the same room as you do in the memory ending, mm. but Ariane does remember you, mm. and Elsa begins to say, "I can't do it. I just can't fulfill our promise." And she says, "No, no, you promised me. You have to do this." Mm. And then Elsa mercy kills Ariane. Yes, uh, the rooms also looks quite a bit different as well. Mm. Um, it's 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 a lot more. There's like a red mist surrounding everything. Yeah, and everything like that. And she does a she does a. She does a James Sunderland and, mm. and smothers her wife to death. Yeah, because like because the game constantly says the words "Remember our promise" over yeah. the course of the story. Mm. Uh, even so much so that the back of the box, the header is "Remember our promise," mm. and it is then revealed in this ending that the promise is "Please kill me. I am in so much pain. Mm. Like I am in suffering. I can't kill myself because I'm so weak. You have to kill me." And by God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I mean prob- that I that I guess that would be the end of the cycle for any other Elsters yeah, is yeah. if you've actually killed Ariane then although you might end up with a very tragic case where the other the other Elster units might be wandering back to that ship to try and see Ariane even though she's yeah, not yeah. dead. I uh, mean it's also tragic because it's the only ending in which Ariane remembers you. Yeah. And because of that that's why you have to do it because you promised her mm. and she remembers that promise. Exactly, yeah. And oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I teared up when I beat the game by yeah. myself. It really made me upset. <laughs> Did you get the the promise ending? I got memory. You got memory. Yeah, I think memory is the most common. Mm, okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then there is one secret ending. Um, you can't actually get this on a normal playthrough. You have to have beaten the game once before. So obviously we were we were using my save to to to, to continue from. Mm. And it's you have to use the radio to collect a sequence of keys throughout all of the levels. Yeah. And then use that to open this safe that's in one of the final rooms, which will then give you some white lilies. Mm. Elster then uses these. It kind of cuts to this like darkened room with a bunch of pillars. Uh, laid out in sequence in a big circle mm. and around each of the pillars is the corpse of one of the characters in the game mm. just lying dead uh elsa then puts the flower on one of the pillars and then also falls down dead and then it cuts to elsa and Ariane dancing on a ship on the penrose yeah like the implication being at least this was the way that you interpreted it was that they will go to some kind of afterlife or some kind of yeah, world, like, the fantasy world that the thing that kind of because I actually hadn't seen it before we did the um before we did it today like I had seen them dancing but I hadn't seen what happens afterwards mm. which kind of to me makes my theory more conclusive which is that in the sky instead of a sun there is Elster's eye from the main menu oh. and it's colored red and she's looking over the world kind of implying she's created this fake reality like she's channeled the power of of the universe tearing apart to create this little pocket dimension where she can be happy with Ariane again. Yeah, I mean, in in many ways, I guess you could also argue that's the best possible outcome as yeah. well. Is is um, uh, but it is one that is you know debatably not real. Yeah, and uh, Elsa does have to kill herself to to get to it. Yeah, there's also the corpses of other th- people lying around, which mm. I thought were the other characters. Yeah, I think they are. Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um. Yeah, I mean, even so, these are all, like, they're real, like, pulling your heartstrings. They really hurt. Mm. Oh, sorry. We've forgotten about the other ending. It's the ending where if you manage to go through the entire game without firing a single shot, and if you manage to collect every collectible, you, you do it within the space of about three hours, Okay. you can go into this door at the end, and you find a dog in there. <laughs> And Elsa goes, it was you who was behind all this. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, was, yeah. And that's how, and that's the best ending in the game. I'd love to see that ending in the Signalis <laughs> cutscene style. Like, it, like, it would be, it was the you all along, but it would appear on this back, this like red background, <laughs> yeah. like it was you all along. I would just like it if the, uh, instead of saying like, Achtung and all this stuff on the red, it just says, woof. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd oh be, my God. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be the best ending. Yeah. Uh, so the story overall, I think for me, what makes it really interesting and powerful is that 
there's this abstract side to it that's very difficult to figure out what's really going on. Mm. Like, it's all about your own interpretation. You never really get a good answer. Like, you don't really get a good answer as to why people are turning into into these monsters. Like, why there's a time loop. Is any of that actually affecting the direct universe? Mm. But what's always carrying your attention and what's keeping you going is this very personal story about love Mm. and about keeping your promises to people and about Ariane and Elster. Mm. And that's the thing for me that makes the game really touching is that it's it's got that personal underpinning that that makes the abstract meaningful, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's an incredibly poignant game. I don't think this is one of those games that would that would benefit at all. I think it kind of detracts if it had a kind of joke ending. Yeah, yeah. Um because there is a there is an artistry to it that I think really does give this a a a, a high level of respect from the very least myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's 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 pretty fucking good. Yeah, I, I feel like you've got the better words for it than me. Like this has definitely resonated with you more than myself. Mm. But I can still respect this as a pretty damn fine work. Oh yeah, I this this say. game really like hit me emotionally. Like I was very mm. very like I think it was one of those games where I finished it, put my controller down, leaned back, and just went. Oh. Yeah, like, it really really struck me. And yeah, mm. it, yeah, that's all I can say about it. It was very personal for me. No, I mean yeah. absolutely. Um. I someone who has a missing wife. Oh yeah. Have you uh, seen my wife? Um I got this picture of her. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry that she looks like two different people. Okay. And that she's also dead. She's de- dead? Don't worry. I'm not crazy. Okay. <laughs> Alright. I, I, I yeah. wasn't saying you were. Um I gotta go throw up in this toilet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but like it's just I think it succeeds in so many different areas. It's really good at this kind of abstract meta commentary on the nature of memory and people and what makes someone a person Mm. and like if you were to begin experiencing the memories of another person at what point would you stop being yourself Mm. but then it also has a really personal story about a woman you care about who goes through difficult goes through a difficult situation and comes out the other end broken basically like i think it's good at being both things yeah Certainly not the feel-good family comedy of the summer. Oh, no, it's, yeah. Uh... It's definitely in sharp contrast to Clock Tower 3. <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, I realise that our list currently is uh, very much populated with horror, which I know we joked would be the case, but I feel like yeah. our first four episodes, we definitely... Um... The greatest horror of all, Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> suddenly instills fear in my heart <laughs> oh gosh i this this episode's been recorded before the shadow of the hedgehog episode goes out i'm expecting at least one comment where people go the real horror is seeing the sonic ocs <laughs> um but i hope you all enjoyed our sonic ocs yeah oh gosh i mean sen put a lot of work into the <laughs> yeah yeah but now he gets to put his work into our into our replicas yeah. into our robot yeah. life forms yeah whatever, whatever we do with this one which will be interesting <laughs> I feel as though I think we've kind of covered basically everything. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you want to go. We've already given our recommendation for this game, but yeah. I so I I actually have a prepared statement. All right, okay. I'd like to make a statement. All right, get, feel free. The press is <laughs> the mics are all here. Well, because one of the recurring themes that we've been coming back to over the course of the entire podcast is how much this game is inspired by Silent Hill. Mm-hmm. Its aesthetics are very similar. It even has enemies and puzzles and concepts that are directly ripped from Silent Hill. It's got a wife. It's got a wife and I got to find her. Where's my wife? Um, But unlike other games that I feel are just empty homages, like games like Lone Survivor, I think this game truly more than anything I've ever played since those games has picked up that baton. It's carried on that legacy. Like it's informed by the classics but it brings its own ideas to the table. It's mm. got its own place to take among those those titans, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, like this is in the 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 Hall of Fame. It's up there with Silent Hill Two, Resident Evil One, Fatal Frame Two, and now Signalis. It's it's that good to me. Damn. It's, it's a classic. It's one of the best of all times. I would really recommend anyone with any even a passing interest seek out this game. Please buy it at the very least, so they'll make more of them because I, I want to see what the team can do next. Yeah, absolutely. They are an incredibly talented bunch. Yeah. Um, like horror isn't exactly my cup of tea, but I can also recommend this. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, was there anything else you'd like to say, or um, shall we get onto the rankings? I'd say let's go onto the rankings. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of quality, I feel like I know where you're going to put this, but where would you put this in terms of quality? Quali- quality. It's really interesting, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Because obviously, when we're doing our rankings personally, mm. privately, I'm ranking Signalis next to 50 other games. <laughs> yes, yeah. But in the podcast, I'm ranking them next to Clock Tower 3 <laughs> and Shadow the Hedgehog. Yeah, yeah. 
It's better than those. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it doesn't have Vector the Crocodile on it, though. You know what? I'm going to go for it. I'm going to say it. Uh huh. I think this is better than Resident Evil 4. Damn. All right. Or I like it more than Resident Evil 4. Okay. It, it's very personal to me. It's very targeted to my aesthetics and my interests. Mm. Like, I like this game a whole lot. Yeah. I think in terms of raw quality and like execution and everything like that, it does a damn good job. The thing is... You're breaking the, my heart, Anakin. I know. This is the, this is the sad thing is where our, our kind of our, our branches path... Our, 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 the, the paths branch away. Uh, yeah. Uh, is, is... You shouldn't uh, listen to Kanye. Kanye was doing a sentence together. <laughs> listen to it. me. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Connor's just cut out the last four minutes of this <laughs> podcast because he doesn't know how to speak. Um, there were there were moments in this game where I got a little bit frustrated at the way that it executed some of its mechanics, and there's and and it's also as much as I really like its story, it doesn't resonate with me quite as strongly. I think I would still want to throw this a bone though and recognize it for being as good as it is. Though. Yeah, this would definitely be be very high. I think I'd wager that out of the fifty or so games we've got on the list, this is this is at the very least top ten. Yeah, um, I'll take it. Like, I'll there, take there's, it. There's a there's a lot of good ones up here. Uh, is is the thing. Yeah, Geist. Uh, <laughs> prison Break, everyone knows. Oh my god, the Prison Break license game. That will be a, a huge contrast <laughs> to Signalis. Uh, um, but this is this is damn good. This yeah. is a damn fine, well-made game. Exactly. Um, I would recommend it to all. Mm, Please yeah. go out and seek Signalis. Totally. At your local retailer. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of interesting, where would you put this on that, that kind of level? Oh, it's kind of... I was going to say it's kind of interesting, which would be really silly. But mm. it's not a game that, like is inherently interesting because of its place in the industry. It's just a really good video game, but I find its story and its world very interesting, you know? Mm, yeah. This is definitely high on interesting for yeah. me as well. In fact, I think if my opinions end up kind of shifting after getting a bit distance between Signalis and, and now... Yeah. Uh, this is the most... We literally beat this game today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think if there was a bit of distance, I'd probably argue I find this game more interesting than I... Oh god, that's a loaded statement to say I find this more interesting than good. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I think these are both equally yeah, up yeah. there in, in that case. Because I think the But theme... that's what's more appealing to you about it. Yeah. Not so much the gameplay, but the themes and the visuals and things like yeah, that. Yeah, the, it's it's execution on that front like really does yeah, like, yeah. stick with me. Uh I think and... it's definitely the most interesting of the three games or the four games we've talked about so far. Y- yeah. I'll I put think... it like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh and in terms of uh fun, which is where just things go really up in the air on this kind of thing. Where would you put this in terms of fun? It's a little confusing. I actually find when it's a game that's really good, sometimes it's not as fun. No, yeah. Because it's not as doofy. Yeah, this is where it's a bit odd um, to talk about sort of fun and games because, like, if I was to do the thing we've incessantly kept doing and compare this with, say, Silent Hill 2, as far as the ranking's concerned, I think Silent Hill 2 is a great game. Yeah. That one's near the top of the list as far as quality is concerned, in my opinion, as well as interesting. But I wouldn't put it very high on fun because yeah. it's not designed to be very fun. It's not a great combat game. The puzzles are fine, you yeah, know, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. It's more of a and, vibe thing than anything. Yeah. yeah. I had good fun playing this with you. Yeah. Uh, and and I'd say, I had no fun. <laughs> I didn't enjoy your company. And I, and, I, and I think if we were talking, talking about it in terms of raw, like, dopamine hitting, sort of like, I've got my gun and I'm bam, bam, and I'm running around, it, it's not up there. Like, like it, it's, it's, it's sort of middle. Oh, that's so weird for me, though, because to me, doing the survival horror thing of exploring an area, that, mm. that is the most fun I have with video games. Mm. That's, like, my favourite genre. I'm just like, oh, yeah, i got to look at this map. No, that's, that's fair. There yeah. is something fun about just soaking in a good atmosphere. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and I, I definitely see the appeal. I'd, I'd put this sort of middle of the road, like bearing in mind that this is going to be competing with racing games, first person shooters and platformers and shit. Yeah. Like it, it's a very strange metric. And that's why I like the idea that we have quality and fun be separate things. Yeah. They, they denote different aspects of the game. Yeah. And interesting is kind of a, <laughs> interesting as a ranking is kind of there to give yeah, guys there, there a fighting are, chance. There are many games on the list that are not good or fun, but we want them to have a high ranking. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was Signalis, and that was episode four of The List Goes On. We have been recording this for nearly two hours. Uh, I think most of this is going to stay in. Yeah, yeah, it's like almost, it's like, it's like past 10 p.m. We've been recording this for... Much later than we've ever done any other game. Oh, Lord knows, yeah. yeah. Um, and like all, all the other games I think we've done from like 3pm to 5. Yeah, yeah. Like, like just had a nice afternoon and this was now. Nah, we've got to take yeah. this into the night. <laughs> um, what a game, Ash. What you... a game. Now, I feel like we shouldn't tease the next thing we're doing on this list. I feel like in case we want to change it last minute, but 
maybe it'll be a nice surprise to kind of leave episode five as a, as a up in the air. What do you think? We're playing Geist. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh! oh gosh! I want I... to talk about Geist. Oh. I refuse to let you take back your Geist promise. They're going to let me weasel my way out to be like, Hey Ash, why don't we talk about... Remember our promise. Why don't we talk about Total War Warhammer? No. no. We're going to talk about Geist. Fifth episode, Geist. <laughs> <laughs> so next week, we'll be talking about Geist for the Nintendo GameCube. Yes, the Halo killer on the GameCube. Uh, you know, it's going to haunt my uh, our podcast. It's suddenly been haunting my every waking moment since. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so please do look forward to us talking about that. Something a little bit more upbeat. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. Um, yeah. Now, uh, Ash, you've got your blog. I've got my world famous blog. Yep. I'm working on a real... Scorcher of an essay right now, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, so feel please feel free to check out Ash's blog, which uh, I'll leave a link to it in the description as well as in the top comment on this uh, video. Uh, and if you're interested in anything more from me, you can check out my main channel, Thunder Psyker, uh, where I will be doing video game retrospectives and some other content as well, which uh, by the time this episode is released, I will have teased what was coming on, what will be coming later on the channel. And, He's talking uh, about Geist. <laughs> there will be a Geist video. A Geist video. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I don't know what I'd do with a Geist video, but uh, I, there's there's definitely things to work with. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for listening, everyone. It has been uh, lovely to have you have you back on Ash. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you have a fantastic day. And remember our promise. <laughs>